Okay, let's start the show. For Thursday, May 16th, 2019, welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. Welcome to uh, This Is Only A Test, our podcast this week. I'm Norm, and if you're watching the video, you know this. We only got, we got, we got our core crew. You didn't say what That's episode it is. What episode number well, is it? <laughs> it's episode 499.5? No. 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 499B hyphen NCC 1701CD? That only works if you cut off the podcast halfway. Or if this is, is this a continuation of last week's podcast? Oh, it's a to be continued. Last week was a two barter. What? Did it, you no. not get the, the the stinger at the end? This to is, be continued. This is episode five hundred. Episode five. Oh, that's right. We are at episode five hundred, but we're saving our special episode for next week. The what? Be, the beginning of the next five hundred episodes. There you go. That's right. That that's is right. not Why not a, a great way to celebrate. Looking that is forward. not how I approached it. I, I'm pulling out all the stops this week. I am literally wearing the same hoodie I wore the first time I appeared on this podcast <laughs> yep. four years ago. Wow. Uh, it is episode 500 by our numbering, although if you look at the entire list of how many episodes, I don't know because mm-hmm. we included our marathon episodes, our special CES episodes we used to do, uh, nightly ones that we split off into multiple episodes, but for our canonical purposes, we have been recording, this is only a test, for nine and a half years now. Holy cannoli. And this is episode 500. Now, you know, we talked about it. Is 500 a big number for podcasts? Yes. Because like, For weekly podcasts? Yes. Really? Yes. They're like script notes from John August just hit 400 this past week. Mm-hmm. You know, PC Gamer's been yeah, doing it much longer. This is 500. 500. That's 400. Yeah, it's true. No, PC Gamer's been doing it longer. That's true. But they they've been doing it since you know what, like the mid knots. I was there at the beginning of that too. Yeah, I didn't get an invitation for episode eight hundred or whatever they're no, at right now. No, uh, but the long story short, scheduling conflicts, planned rest, whatever you want to call it, uh, load management. But next week we're gonna get some special guests. They could not make it this week, so. Very special. Very special. I will still wear this hoodie next week. The 501st episode (laughs) will be very special indeed. Uh, But we have a very classic traditional episode and let's just, well, let's jump into what you guys did this past weekend. Oh God. Because it was Mother's Day. How was your Mother's Day? Excellent. I took my wife out to fondue. Yeah, oh, dude. Oh, you do fondue. <clears throat> yeah. Like Captain yeah. America. Like 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 uh, Howard Stark. How is this not the greatest form of eating ever invented? It's just dipping things in cheese. Yeah. It's, it's like amazing. A, it's like a buffet right in front of you. Yeah. What do you, With sticks. What do you want? And you don't, did you do the oil or just the cheese? Uh, we just did cheese. Yeah. The, it's the, perfect. The problem with fondue. Oh, no. Are you I about have... to hate on fondue? No, no. I like fondue. I'm saying the, the challenge to fondue is you need a constant heat source. If the heat is not perfectly temp, if the heat's too hot, mm-hmm. the cheese is too soft. And I don't like too soft cheese, too melty cheese. If the heat is not, if, if heat turns off, if you lose the heat, then you get congealing cheese mm-hmm. and you get gross cold cheese. So heat management is important. If there are only control systems for managing heat, I'm just saying food. It's 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 very it's it's a lot of it's a it's it's a lot of perfect temperature timing. What's cheese you have with fondue? Is there a certain cheese? Well, there's lots of different options. Yeah, they have uh, usually there's a well, there's like a Swiss kind of Mm. variant. I had an Emmentaler based cheese, Um, and the place I went had like ten different, you know, uh, uh, combinations of cheeses. Speaking to the mic. Okay, yes, did, this did microphone. You, did, lift it up. I, did, I, I did like you, the more stinkier cheeses. Did you go here in the city? 
Yeah, I went to a place called Fondue Cowboy. Yeah, I've been there. Oh, I've never heard of this. It was fun. Yeah. All right. Bookmarking this for, for future. The, the best place is, is slightly south of here. The best place I've been in the Bay Area called La Fondue. La Fondue. Yeah. Neither of those sound like great fondue pun names. D- no. Did you ever go to Fondue Fred's when you were in college? No. A fondue Fred's in Berkeley. Is so that good? both uh, Norm and I went to Cal, and there's this kind of terrible fondue place mm. on the south side of campus called Fondue Fred's that's mm. been there for like 25 years. I took my dates to Claster Establishments. Good for you. <laughs> uh, it is like low rent fondue, which is not good. Okay. All right. The, 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 the enough fondue talk for the week. Well, hey, what, let, let me tell you what I did because I have a oh, friend yeah, yeah, who's yeah. leaving town. Like I have a, I'm in a pinball league, right? And Per Schwarzenberger has led this league for, uh, but the better part of of a decade, and he's heading to Arizona. And so to give him a goodbye party, one of our league members turns out is a bubble guy, right? Oh, but so what does that mean, so a we, bubble we, guy? It's when you, we, we went to Golden Gate Park, oh, and no. he brought all the buckets and the huge poles. This is like finding out if one of your friends is a part-time clown. They, they must have like 10, 12-foot poles. He like to poles. entertain the children? And he, made, he designed his own ropes with all the loops and different styles of, of loops. He had like five different setups, one of which looks like a pinball machine when you open it up. So the bubbles come out, you know, kind of like a pinball machine. Oh, wow. And it was the best. It was the best. Do you have photos or video? Yeah, lots of, lots of them. That's but a great you, opportunity to shoot some high-speed video on your phone. I did. And nice. they're great because they got the refraction. on All the lights, yeah, are, yeah. They, they go into the bubble, and the, it shows off in purple and, and pinks. Dogs go crazy for bubbles. Kids do. Kids Adults do. Well. do. Yeah. And he let us do it, and it was great. I got yelled at by a bubble guy once. Why? Why? In, in, um... Because you popped his bubble. No, 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 no. In, in Prague. In Prague, because it turned out it was... Um... Not a grifter, but like a, a guy who wanted money if you took a picture of him. Okay. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he was in the park. He was doing bubbles. I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. I took a picture and then immediately ran up and put his hand out and said, pay me. Oh. He's like that. I, I gave him some cash. That hangover guy that's in Vegas now. Yeah. Yeah. There were also bubbles where I was at this weekend. I was in the Presidio. Uh, there was a, 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 a big picnic thing going on. And uh, families were there. Off the grid was there. So a lot of food trucks. Yeah. And so uh, old friends like Gary Wood and I walked along the food truck lines and bought a bunch of bunch of food. That's a good place to buy a bunch of food. Yeah, yeah. You can overeat very easily. And kids ran around and there were bubbles there. And good good place to go dog spotting if you uh, if you like looking at cute dogs. We also went to this place. We did this last Mother's Day too. I forget what they call it. Like the decorators showcase. Do you know this or the, the designers showcase? Do you know about the so SD's uh, San Francisco Design Center? No, it's one every there's every year they take a month and they take at one house in San Francisco that is up oh. for sale, but maybe isn't selling well, and they let th- like twenty designers in the Bay Area go nuts on one room each. Wow. How and, is this not a HGTV reality show, and competition all, show? All of the designers have to pay for all the materials themselves. Okay. But they get the exposure of these people. And this, this house was packed on Mother's Day, and it's packed for the whole month. So presumably- You buy a, tickets to get in. It's a very uh, like big house. And yeah. It's a grand- This was in Presidio Heights mansion. It was yeah. enormous. And apparently, like, it's- it had fallen under disarray. Still going on? Yes. What's it called? I think like the decorators showcase or the designers showcase. You know what? Danica would love this. Uh, but I'm telling you, like crazy design ideas, and every room is so different from the next. It's like you're walking through 20 different houses. This sounds like HGTV, the the li- yeah. live experience. And we're watching a lot of HGTV right now. Yeah. At least at, at home, Danica is, and she's a designer, so yeah, yeah. You, you, good thing she doesn't listen to the podcast. She would love this surprise. Uh, so yeah, th- we had a good day. But a good nice. day. Well, nice. happy Mother's Day happy to Mother's all, day, the all the Mother's Day. That's right. That put up with our BS. Oh, it's so much BS. So much BS. Um, so let's get to our top story then. Top story this week. Uh, I, oh, it would be remiss to mm-hmm. not mention that today, as we're recording this, is also uh, Will's birthday. Which is one of the reasons that it would have been great if he was in today. Aww. Happy birthday, Will. Happy birthday, Will. I think that's a good think choice not to, to come in, come into the podcast on your birthday. It's fair to say none of us would be here, I think, without Will. Right? He I, none of us would be here without our parents. <laughs> no, I mean I mean Tested owes its roots to Will and yes. Norm. Yes. But Will yeah. was the founding member. Yes. 
Yeah, and he the, hired me as the, the first employee. Yeah, you're, you're, you're his number one. Better than me number two. <laughs> <laughs> um, so maybe he'll pop in uh, in a future episode. Who knows? 500 first, 500 first. Um, our top story is going to be kind of in the realm of pop culture. Because this past week, on Monday, in fact, I did something awesome. Because Shore and I, together, uh, we went for a special screening mm-hmm. of What We Left Behind. A seven-year-in-the-making documentary about one of the most seminal shows in, in, in science fiction history in You're, Star Trek. It's Star Trek Deep Space Nine. You heard the theme at the top of the show. And what a what an experience. It, it was so deeply enjoyable. Hmm. It was kind of a strange film. We have to admit, like, the way it was sort of pieced together. Well, this was a Fathom Events type thing. The, thing's gonna be, the film is going to be released on Blu-ray and, and digital download uh, sometime in the near future. They did an Indiegogo campaign to raise funds for it. But it's a storied uh, documentary in itself because uh, of, of how it came to be and the evolution of the story they wanted to tell and how they wanted to tell it. Now, the screening itself was fantastic. It was a packed audience. Uh, our local theater was like one night only. Um, you know, a friend of the site uh, um, I was there. Faraday was there. Uh, we had I met some other tested uh, fans there. And I'm so glad we got to see it on the big screen. Yeah, it was it, for a couple reasons. One was just the experience of being there with a bunch of other Trek fans or some people that were dressed up. Uh, and there was just moments of delight and the whole crowd laughing together. But the other thing, and backers of the Indiegogo campaign know this, is that they remastered 20 minutes of footage from SD to HD and debuted it. Uh, and one of the the scenes they remastered, because they, they remastered a bunch of clips they used, but one of the scenes they remastered um, was the key battle sequence from the end of Season 7. Oh, so Ooh, what, one was, of the most glorious space battles ever. Was that remaster not done for the series like it was for Next Gen? No. no. So the, the the Next Gen had its own storied remastering thing, right? Like like Next Gen back in the day, those were both shows shot on on film, but edited on video. So as we all know with Next Gen, it was a very laborious process where they they weighed the financial economic benefits of it, and they did an experiment where they re-edited, they scanned all the entire series, all the film they could find, and basically re-edited it based on all the editing notes, and then introduced CG elements to update the graphics, and then released that one season at a time in TNG and Blu-ray. And did very well for the first couple of seasons, to the point where they got their workflow down, and then did all seven seasons of Next Generation. It's all on Netflix now. What you see on Netflix now is, you know, against all odds, we have an HD version of Next Generation. For the original series, they did that a long time ago, much easier done. The footage was, you know, it was again, all film, but it was all cut together, not on video. So Deep Space Nine, there was much less chance of them doing that because, one, the show isn't revered as much as Next Generation in popular culture, even among Star Trek fans, and they address that. And two, Next Generation, that remaster ended up being kind of a catastrophe financially for CBS because they invested all the money, but it was right at the point where people were stopped buying Blu-rays and really streaming kicked in. Hmm. And so they weren't able to recoup all their costs. And so they said, they you know, never say never, but it was very unlikely they were going to do for DS9. And, and I don't think it was just the cost of actually remastering it. They invested some money in like advertising it yeah. and rolling it out and making it so, and having broad distribution. Uh, so all of that, I think, uh, cost a lot of money. Yeah, and, and so for this documentary, which was uh, initiated by one of the collaborators of, um, of William Shatner, and William Shatner himself has done a bunch of Star Trek documentaries. He's, he's done a, 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 like a lot of them, actually. You can find them all online. Uh, and they were co-directed by this guy, uh, David, I want to say his name is. Um, and he wanted to do a DS9 documentary. And realized that William Shatner probably had no interest in doing a DS9 documentary. So he reached out to the, one of the showrunners of DS9, Iris Stephen Bear, and got him to collaborate with him. This is seven years ago to do a DS9 documentary. 
And it would be interviews with the cast, interviews with the crew, the whole storytelling of the series, but favorite episodes, your standard documentary um, format. And then they decided they would need that footage from the show. And they kind of figured out they would need about 22 minutes, 20, 22 minutes of footage. And so they raised money through the Indiegogo campaign to one, do the battle scene initially as their test footage. And then they said they had to do it. And so at the end of the proper documentary, we got to stick behind the theater and watch this round table of the filmmakers, of the producers, of the director, of our Stephen Bear, and t- have them uh, on screen tell us about the process of going to the CBS archives and making specific requests for like, we need, you know, five seconds of footage from this episode. Well, how are you going to get five seconds of that footage? They had to go back to the editing logs and the then shooting logs, yeah, the yeah. shooting log to say what shots were used from what day. Then the archivists over at CBS had to go and find the reels. And it wasn't just like, here's four reels of 40 minutes each for this one episode. These were like the days they were shot. So they could have been reshoots. And, and they had to find the right takes, cut them in, go through a grading pass, brought in the cinematographers from those seasons to sit in the editing room with them. And who the cinematographer, this is one of the greatest things, the cinematographers never, while making the show, never, even though it was shot on film, never saw the footage ever in HD because the dailies were all processed in yeah. video. So you get SD dailies, essentially. And he was able to sit in their this documentary editing room and grade the film with them, grade the series with them as he remembered it 20 years ago. <laughs> Super cool. And then here's the best part of the documentary, my favorite part, was to make it a little different, they decided, and, and um, this has been done to various degrees of success with other like fan-favorite shows and at conventions and in comic book form, but they brought the original writers together into a, a, a writer's room. And this includes people like Iris Steven Bear, but also like Ronald D. Moore, who went on to reboot Battlestar Galactica, right? And they brought them in to do a outline session with whiteboards all around the room for what a season eight <gasps> episode one would look like. Wow. And it was kind of amazing because it, like they immediately dove right back into it and they started arcing a show. And then it became clear that they forgot elements of the show. And they're like, wait, how did that character die? And like they had an argument about trying to remember how the character died. But their brainstorm, their outline session was... It was it was done in a way to evoke how they would have outlined individual episodes back in the day. Not how you would, you know, script yeah. it. They would break down the acts, whiteboard. They actually had ideas that they said, no, this, they got to save that character for later. Um, and then what the filmmakers did with that storytelling is they then storyboarded that outline and animated it. So you got an animated storyboard look of what a full season eight episode one would look like. And I'm not going to reveal the plot because it's so good for fans of DS9. But at the end of that session, all the writers like, this would be good enough to do 26 episodes. Because back in the day, Star Trek was 26 episodes a season. Is this movie a sales pitch for another season of DS9? It's never going to happen. No. Ah. It's never going to happen. But it's it's the it's pure f- fan service. So it, it sounds like the documentary is for fans. Like, it is absolutely for fans. 100%. There were so many like inside conversations and whatnot. What I forgot, I, I mean, DFC Ace Nine is obviously is oftentimes referred to as the war track because there's there's a war happening and you see elements of war that are hard to look away from. But what I had forgotten, and this is a hallmark of all Star Trek, is that how it tackled social issues was so Im- impressive and forward uh, compared to what we we had seen prior, like how they handled issues around like civil rights and they clearly had a uh, a main character that was gay and they had uh, a lot of different social issues just sort of come to the fore and i think we forget that in retrospect but um i, I thought that was I mean, a I, really nice part of the documentary i, I, I teared up because um famously the lead captain of the show avery brooks plays captain cisco 
does uh, not. Jeremy's favorite actor of all time, I believe. <laughs> he does not speak about DS9. He Come said, on, "Don't throw me under the bus." <laughs> I've seen the first episode. You've seen the pilot. We filmed it. We filmed Jeremy's reaction to Emissary. Part Even one. fans agree it's not the best episode. Oh, and, 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 no, and Avery Brooks is kind of a strange right. guy, and he overacts a bit. You know, he he uh, was the first time I saw Avery Brooks uh, before I saw DS9 was in school because he did a. Was it a PBS production of? But a movie, he was in the first twelve years a slave. Um, he played that role. And he played it brilliantly. And oh. anyway, he's a wonderful actor, uh, and he famously does not talk about Star Trek DS Nine. His time with it, like he said, everything he's had to say. He didn't really actively participate in his documentary. He, there are there's interview footage and convention footage, mm-hmm. archival, and, archival, and and he's kind of said everything, um, but. We learned things about his portrayal on the show because one, it was you know the first black captain on Star Trek, and his hair. Like we all think of Avery Brooks, his transition from you know his goatee grows out throughout the season, like throughout the series. Like he doesn't his facial hair, his hair changes. He's not bald, but we don't realize is the look he has as the show goes on is his real look. They made him shave his goatee and, and grow hair for the first season because at the time UPN Paramount CBS wasn't comfortable with that look they they it was pure racism and watching that show I never realized that they, what are you saying that he he originally looked like he does in later seasons yes and as they an made actor. It, they made him change that they look? made him change that look for Star Trek because their market research or the executives... Because like, he's African-American? Be, yes, because they literally say on the documentary, they have an executive. It's one of the cringiest it's moments. It's super cringy. Like, they're, the showrunner, I remember is interviewing, like, the CBS or Paramount executive who, like, <laughs> greenlit the show, and they're like, yeah, that time was a different time, and, you know, we he tries to talk around, he goes, we, for lack of a better word, it was... We thought it was too street, and I'm like, Whoa! And it just makes you realize in the 90s, which was not that long time ago, it's, you know, it's, things haven't really changed. Um, But as, you know, as a 12-year-old watching the show, I didn't know that, Mm. right? And I didn't didn't realize that the relationships that he had on the show with him and his son, Jake Sisko, like, and his father, like, those were groundbreaking things at the time. And I just saw it as, like, this is a normal family. And mm-hmm. and it was amazing. And to me, like the the transformation of his hair of of that uh, hair and and his look, kind of suited the storyline that was happening. So I thought it was planned. But then to hear it presented that way really shed light on on what was going on. Amazing. If you're a prop nerd, a Star Trek nerd, uh, just sort of um, a a film buff of some kind, uh, this is kind of a documentary. It's it's all together very weird. It's put together in a very kind of jump around naval kind of gazy matter. way. Yeah, it's very very insider. You know, they have the actors who are ha- who clearly love being on the show. You know, there was the cliche that when you have the Star Trek actors work together for seven years, they become a family, and they acknowledge that. But it became for them it was more than that because they had this special place where they were almost the runt in the family. Right in the Star Trek universe, they were the fans. They, they, the, all the actors take turns reading out hate mail about DS Nine. Really? Yeah, because the show was never loved in its time. See, you guys are making me feel. I don't know. Like, I feel a little bit better about myself hearing that because I've always contested that Next Gen is far superior. And to it, hear you guys and some other people talk about it, I feel like I've missed out on DS Nine. And you have because it comes around, and the show gets redeemed in the most wonderful way, they have these confessionals from fans and everyone, all the fans acknowledge that back then they mm. might, not have, might not have liked it, hmm. but now it is the show that is maybe the most Star Trek All right, of all the shows. And so I implore maybe. you, Jeremy. Maybe. <laughs> it's a big I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about that, that line, that it's the most Star Trek. Well, because... it is more Star Trek in, the, in ways that people don't realize, in ways that people... For all the rallying against, like, this isn't Star Trek. It's not on a starship. You know, it's about war. Gene Roddenberry never wanted war. It's not about a utopia. Introduce things like Section 31. Like, all the issues that it tackles and the way it tells its story and the boldness in which it tells its story, 
is very much in the ethos of Star Trek. And it's it, it's not Twilight Zone. It's not it's not episode of the week. I mean, the serial nature of it is is groundbreaking. Um, and it made, watching that documentary made me want to go home and just binge DS9, even though it's on SD. I mean, it made me dream of a, you know. For, I for did watch time. an episode when oh, I got home, and I got mad that it was an SD. I know. Really? I did. I mean, you you just saw on screen what it looked like, and it, it really made a difference. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so go watch some DS9, everyone. It's, it's worth it. All right, bunch of stuff in pop culture this week. You know, uh, Disney has announced their big slate of films. Last week, we had two updates on that. Uh, one is that even though there are some Pixar films on that slate through 2027, lots of untitled uh, Pixar, lots films. of untitled films. Our speculation was how much, how many of these would be sequels. Well, it turns out after Toy Story 4 coming out this summer, the next big batch of Pixar films will all be original films. No more sequels for the foreseeable future. I couldn't be more excited about this. This seems perfect. Every Pixar uh, property um, that I've seen I uh, at this point, I either have gotten enough sequels or I don't need a sequel. Yes. Like, I loved Inside Out. I don't need oh. Inside Out 2. No, 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 no. Do you need an Incredibles 3? That one I prob- is probably the one I'm the softest on, like I could be convinced of. But no, I felt like too satisfied what I really wanted out of the franchise. And you're done with Toy Story, having not even seen Toy Story 4. I am so done with Toy Story. <laughs> I'm done with the fishes. Like Nemo and Dory are fine. Yeah. Uh, I don't need no more cars. Mm-hmm. Like who else is left? I don't think anyone is out there clamoring for good dinosaur too. I watched that again recently. How is it? Eh. You How know, they it, ever finished it? It's the least performing uh, Pixar film of all yeah. time, you know? And it, I don't know. It kind of feels about right. Yeah. And the one that I will say that it, my favorite Pixar film is Wally. And in, in my heart, I want a second one, but I think it's a perfect film. I don't want them to, to go there. I'd be, I'm, I'd be open to that. I want to know what Stanton has in mind, you know? Like, what... Because what, I imagine with the right story, we could get a pretty interesting sequel. But it would have to be, a, you know, have to be the right story. I don't think it'd have... It wouldn't have... It wouldn't be about Wally. It would mm. probably be about another robot. What is Wally's counterpart on another ship? Was that ship the only ship with all the humans? Or right. was there another arc ship? Yeah, see. And there are a lot of robot characters in that world that have a lot of personality, you know? Um, so I'm, I too, I'm glad it's going to be original stories. I, I'm glad they're not announced yet. I mean, just op- it's an imagination factory. And so we'll, we'll be looking forward and we'll buy their tickets when they come out. Uh, the other big question was, uh, whether the stars films that are coming out in, uh, three years now, mm-hmm. 2022, 2025, and, or no, is it? 225, 22, 246, right? 246, yes. 2022, 2024, 2024, 2026. Alternate years between Avatar for the holidays. Oh, I didn't catch that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Be all Avatars one Christmas yeah. and then Star Wars other Christmas. <laughs> kind of a, yeah, well, whatever. Yeah. Uh, they, it is confirmed, Bob Iger confirmed that this will be from the uh, showrunners of Game of Thrones, David Benioff and D.B. Weiss to David's. Mm-hmm. And the wow big, has the. The sea changed under them. I mean, uh, over the past few weeks. So, what, what timing to announce it? Right in the middle of the yeah. final season of Game of Thrones, and amid some maybe some backlash about the writing on that show for the final season. Uh, so, may I, I'm, is you know, can we give this some a little more context? Yes. Like I have not watched any Game of Thrones for the, since whatever season five. I have no idea. So I don't know what's going on. I'm planning to watch this Sunday's because it's the last one. Wait, wait, you can't do that. I'm going to do it. Wait, you're just going to jump to the end? I'm going to do it. Yes. No. no. I mean, Jeremy, it. they're totally on a different planet is... now. But I mean, outside of that, like. <laughs> okay. you, you can't do that, hey, Jeremy. chill out. I'm going to do it. My question <sighs> is what about this season, without spoiling anything, has caused people to turn on these poor people so much? I, it's the how rushed it feels. Yeah, I think the general sense is that 
the show the show's strength was its character development, its nuanced character development. Yeah. And so there's been some conclusions brought to some of the character arcs. And I think the mo- main complaint is how is that consistent with the character development that we've seen over seven years? Are, they, are they not the logical conclusions? I, I think they're uh, debatable. I, I think for some, I think absolutely that's the case. I think for others, it's really murky and it just feels rushed. Like we have X episodes. We just got to get this done. Yeah. And some was like, I would say for a couple, that there was just like pure fan service. Mm. And, and it occurred that way for a show that was never really about fan service. Game of Thrones was famous for making you feel frustrated with character tw- deaths, with big plot twists yeah. that uh, frustrated you as fans, but then and ultimately felt satisfying when you, when you then delved back into the buildup and how it was all really planned and how people got what they deserved because it wasn't a show about happy endings. It was a show about real consequences mm-hmm. f- in, in this fantasy world. And anything can happen, even anything to can your happen. favorite character. Yes. And it turns, it feels like with the last six episodes of this final season eight, that things are falling too neatly into place in some for some characters. We weren't, we weren't getting unexpected deaths. So that's saying, all feeling... Oh, it's too sweet. Some of those were like too appropriate. Like, oh, it's like very, like, huh. they, they, they were not bold enough to... to to do unexpected turns. Is this because they've gone off and done their own thing without the writer well, of the authors leading the, the Probably. The and, and also, because I think also because it felt rushed. If if the things that happened in this season happened over the course of maybe three seasons with a lot more nuance, with a lot more kind yeah. of gradual turns, uh, then yes. Uh, yeah. And also, it feels like there's no place for the show to go. Like, they built up to these big threats, and everything was this culmination. And I think everyone knows what the conclusion's going to be. Very too. tough for, for them to write a satisfactory conclusion for resolving the quote-unquote Game of Thrones, and then also the, you know, the, the, the invasion from the north. Uh, God, there's so much that you don't know, not having seen. Yeah, okay. I, I would say there's just one too many coincidences, or... Five too many coincidences hmm. of characters just sort of like running into each other. And the fast travel stuff, yeah, fast which you can only forgive for so much, right? Like the show, well, the first couple seasons, if you recall, like people are traveling through Westeros and like it really got a sense of space and distance because they were breaking the stories up. Like you would watch one episode and it would be like half a dozen, if not more, different character groupings that you'd be following. Yeah. Right. It would be like checking in on this character for one scene and checking on this and the character for one scene. And you're invested in one or two of them, and you want them to get back to those two, and they don't. <laughs> that was my experience. Right. But it would also make sense because you were these trajectories of the characters were sp- splitting apart, eventually converging, and now that they've everyone's kind of back together because it is culminating. Yeah. There's not. There's only like two places they're bouncing oh, between. Interesting. And. It's everything's too convenient. Okay, like it, you know, they only have so much time. They are, can't. Are they, you sure people aren't being too hard on these guys? So I, I the what? Being too hard on these guys. The, I, I think I, I acknowledge that writing these shows are hard. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think that if you look at a uh, satisfactory conclusions, other there's shows not have, many of them. Other shows have done it better. No, but there are not that many satisfactory conclusions to epics like this. To epics, sure. Lord of the Rings. Oh, come on. That was written already. There was books it like completed. Like TNG ended well. TNG, DS9. If you talk about non-genre shows, you know, Six Feet Under. Uh, uh, but Sopranos, once heralded as the greatest TV show of our generation, didn't end well. But that ended on the creator's terms in a way that I, I think yeah. if you very sad. The Wire. And it ended yeah. ended well. Mm. Lost, I think Game of Thrones lost probably was. lost as a cultural phenomena. Like that's the best comparison in terms of and and Lost probably looks a lot better compared yeah. to Game of Thrones. I, I do want to say like the wild swings from like episode two of the season where they were being heralded as geniuses to uh, like episode four where people are like, I can't see anything <laughs> to episode five where just everyone is unhappy. Oh, that's a big arc for one season. Yeah, it's just this crazy swing, so, which makes this announcement even stranger from Bob Iger. Because it's just like, why don't you wait for all of that just to equilibrate right. a little bit? Well, at least they're going to have from the outset 
the scope of work. They're going to know it's three films over the course of six years, and they, they're going to start from scratch, and they know where they want to end up. And their cinematography this season has been top-notch. So oh, I think yeah, yeah, that's yeah. one thing you can be really confident in. With yeah, this I think next uh, Star Fabian Wars. Wagner, I think, is the the DP for the episodes. Uh, some of the best stuff to come out of this season, if you're a fan of filmmaking, are uh, the behind the scenes. They produced very long behind the scenes. I don't, not really documentaries because there is going to be like a separate documentary. Like the finale is this Sunday, and then the week after that, they're going to be it's a full feature length documentary oh, about no the making of the final season. Hmm. But for every one of these six episodes afterward, you can actually find them on YouTube. There's an episode, a thing called The Game Revealed, and it's, some of them are like 40 minutes long. There was one that's like 30 minutes long, and these are real great in depth looks into the making of an episode. And it's interviews with the cast, but more importantly, interviews with the effects artists, the prop makers, the production designer, Deborah Riley. Like for this most recent episode, without spoiling it, they had to rebuild in Belfast a large chunk of King's Landing. And they talk about the building of these episodes, or the building of these actual structures. They, they show the, the production design art. They talk about how they, they hide destruction in the walls as they're, as they're like layering in the, the, the foam and the stucco and, and building in the pipes for flames to come out of windows. And, oh, wow. And how they CG in the dragons. Like there's a shot of a, um, you know, of course there are dragons in this show and they fly around and how they composite in real explosions and put a, you know, a, a spider cams. Nope. That they use to film like sports like in games. Football? Like in football, yeah. exactly. Like, I, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, I've you know, seen football. Yeah, yeah, you can drop some knowledge there. Uh, but how they have these like wire cams that go along. They put a flamethrower on one. That's awesome. And then that's how they got their flame dragon effect, film that on green screen, and then composite that in, over, <sighs> over CG. That's pretty good. Uh, to stunt people, you know, putting on 22 stunt people, actors, performers, mm-hmm. getting burned at the same time on in one shot. On fire, Jeez. and how they choreograph the action for that. Like this is super, super cool behind the scenes. Okay, and that's all without having seen this documentary. Yeah, all exactly. Right. Yeah, <laughs> great. Yeah, well worth watching. Okay, uh, so that's that's our. Yeah, I know a lot of people have been asking, "Have you guys seen Game of Thrones? You guys don't talk about Game of Thrones?" And yeah, well, that's our big shout out. Definitely worth watching. It's called The Game Revealed. Um, if you haven't watched that already, uh, more TV stuff. Black Mirror season five. The trailer dropped. It's three episodes. It'll be coming out June 5th on Netflix. Uh, there's some cast announcements. I'm not going to spoil it if you want to go into it completely cold, but some rather famous names are in the season. Uh, oh. It's not going to be Bandersnatch style yeah. choose your own adventure, which they're doing now. We didn't talk about that last week, but Netflix, of course, going all in with the choose your adventure style storytelling. Yeah. Uh, is it Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt's doing a full uh, episode? Choose Your Own Adventure. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, interesting. So they're going in all different genres of, of Netflix shows. Um, very excited for Black Mirror Season 5. And then also Rick and Morty Season 4 announced for November this year. That's a big deal because it's always a mystery if that show is going to continue or just Well, they signed that big deal, right? They, they signed that huge contract that's going to be like like three or four seasons they've, they've locked in. But Justin is kind of a, a weird character. Uh, behind the scenes, like he's like, it'll be done when it's done. Yeah, they well, that's what they renewed with Adults from seventy episodes, right? Like last and year, and this is only ten, probably. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's crazy. Uh, other big technology uh, news with entertainment: Disney, which is still launching Hulu, or Disney Plus later this year, is now full control of Hulu. They bought out Comcast share. Or they it's, asserted control, asserted whatever. control. They have all voting rights, so they're going to lead the production. NBC, Comca- NBC Universal slash Comcast is planning on launching its own service to compete. So mm-hmm. they're going to get like $27 billion from their share of Hulu, which is a lot of freaking money to kickstart their own. They got that extra 30 from selling off uh, whatever – or. No, that's Fox that had the extra yes. thirty for yeah. Disney. Yeah, Disney's just shelling out cash. I know they're also know. making it. So I'm familiar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they've <laughs> got all of it. But wh- what's going to distinguish Hulu and Disney Plus? Doesn't it feel like Hulu's one of the first services that'll go away? Because Disney Plus 
They're <laughs> there. You can see the multi-year arc they have going to this. They even have like a Pixar series. What does that mean though? Out. Like, do they give everyone with the Hulu subscription a Disney Plus subscription? I don't think. I think I they're going to be if they're paying that much money for a controlling stake. I think one, they get to hedge their bets because Disney Plus is only original programming and, and library stuff, but pay to watch. Hulu has a pay to watch angle to it, but Hulu also has a commercial has a built-in audience that will not pay, but will watch the commercials. No, you have to pay, don't you? You can watch not on your mobile device. You can watch in a web browser. Only on like your computer. Yeah. But it's, an, it's a still a place for Disney to sell ads outside of traditional network television. And the one Hulu is the one that just doesn't make sense in my mind longer term. Like I understand Netflix, I can understand Disney Plus, I can understand even like each network's own version of this Mm -hmm. kind of sustaining. But Hulu as like a conglomerate of like a subsection of some of the networks with some original programming and some live TV, it feels like a smorgasbord of some bits of everything else. If they were to merge the two audiences and use Hulu Plus subscription subscribers as a way to bootstrap Disney Plus initially, which I don't think they need, that does make them a formidable, you know, all, all out of the gate in terms of just sheer revenue and, and audience size, competitor to Netflix and Amazon Prime. But Hulu, as a brand, if they did that, it would have to go away. And I think Hulu is a strong enough brand that they don't, they should, there's this value there, right? They don't need to to do that. You know, if, if anything, then they would have been the ones that, to pull out of, if they wanted licensing, to pull out of the Hulu deal and the Comcast pay them, and then just put all their efforts into Disney+. Plus. Uh, all right. Moving on, a couple things. Have you guys see the new Lego set announced this week? No. Oh, Jeremy. What? Stranger Things. Lego Stranger Things. Lego Stranger Things. Okay. It's the buyer household. You got Google this right now. Wow. You got to take a look. Okay. No, the, Lego put out a like a animated, you know, like a teaser video that doesn't show the set, but the set is out there now. It's two hundred dollars, twenty two hundred pieces, which gets you to your ten cents a piece. It looks. Badass. Does it have it, the words on the wall? It has the words on the wall, and they light up. Is it going to light up? They yeah. Light, oh, what? Nice. What do you mean they light up? They light up. Legos don't light up. Yeah, they do. Now, get this. It's the house. Dude, what do you mean they light up? Oh, is there an upside down? Is there an, an upside down? upside down version of the house. Yeah, that's a terrible picture, Jeremy. <laughs> and everyone listening who's you know on their phone right now. I didn't take it, Norm. <laughs> I'm just, it's a p- terrible picture for you to find to be a representation <laughs> of the set. Just go click Google Images. Images. There you go. Second, first or second picture. Oh. It's the house oh. that's built on top of a darker grayscale bluish version of the very same house. Does it stand? It's And then you have these two giant trees on the left and right of the house. Do they act are, as stands? And they are stands. Yes. It floats I up l- Look at that freaking on the truck. Trees. That truck looks perfect. And so you can display it upside down. Oh, wow. Or oh my goodness, right side up. What is? is Can that, we bring back Lego with friends is for this, this? Who is this? Is this the mom character? Yeah, I think so. It, so a lot of mini figs. Why does? She, why is she like Superman upside down? No, no, the, the upside down is is, the, is Will. Oh, of course, it's the kid. He's the one lost. Oh, no. Now there's no Barb, no Barb mini figs. Ah, oh, I'm out. So this no is Steve. this is like season one. It's season one. Okay, yeah, it's season. One. But what a Crazy great idea. Lego stores the, around the, the world. The Demi Gorgon minifig looks great. Well, who's yeah. who's where's Eleven? She's right there right with there. the waffle. Come on. Oh, oh, right. I forgot she she was she had the the pink dress. That's right. She's got the the hair. That's interesting. I'm starting to wonder if you watch this show. <laughs> I don't. She. This looks different than I remember. They, they are Lego versions of the character, so I guess you can be forgiven. Uh, but. <laughs> Very excited for this set. Uh, you got to have the right display area for it. I, I, I'm sure they've decided to be sturdy enough to be displayed on those trees. Can we get this and build it? 2,200 pieces. It's, it'd be a long build. I want to. We'll you've, think about it. You've done bigger builds. I have so many sets I haven't built yet. All right. We'll talk. We'll think about it. We'll talk about it. Uh, and then finally, uh, in pop culture news, a little bit of rumor. You got John Wick 3 coming out, of course, but the was this director of John Wick 3 dropped hints that the Wachowskis are potentially working on... Matrix 4. Matrix 4. Matrix yeah. rebooted? 
Revolutions, Reloaded, I, it Rebooted. Sounds, is that what you got from it? I thought it was straight after the last two. Well, I mean, what's after the last? Two? I mean, like a reboot would a, be like a rethinking of the whole I'm thing. I'm saying that the software of the Matrix, oh, in the uh, world, oh, right? Yeah. Now, if those, if this was to happen, one, I lose my shit. Love the Matrix, <sighs> dude. Can I love right the, for coming back. I Keanu's, love the Matrix. Less love for two and three. I, 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 the mythology, I'm still a fan of. Okay. Uh, would this take into account the events that happened in the Matrix Online? Which Warner Brothers and the Wachowski have said is canonical. Okay. From the death of Morpheus to the, the you know the actual Matrix still be existing. Mm-hmm. You know, would would they bring that, or would this be, you know, it's very very fashionable now for filmmakers to go back and just say we're going to make a sequel, but not take into account the other sequels. Is that called retconning? I guess it is. Terminator is going to do that. The new Terminator movie is going to only take into consideration Terminator 1 and 2, Terminator 3, Salvation, all that stuff. Genesis did not exist in the in, in the eyes of the new Terminator film. Uh, Halloween did that because Halloween only took into consideration, I believe, the first one. You didn't watch Halloween. I did watch the, the new Halloween. You did? I did. Wow. Yeah, I rented it on iTunes. H2O, watched... is that what that was? No, but it was more than that. Uh, I feel very mixed about this. Very mixed. Why is that, Kishore? I love the mythology, too, and uh, The Matrix left on a sour note. Yeah. Right. And, but it started on, like, one of the highlights of my life. So, yeah. like, they still get that. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm, I'm with Norm. I would go into this open-minded because it has been so long, and they have a lot more films under their belt, the belt now. But if, But having more films, I don't think, is necessarily a benefit because... When they expanded the landscape of the Matrix, mm. I think that's where it got lost. Like the first film is brilliant, not just because of the mythology, because it's a really contained movie with only essentially like two or three characters. I mean, apologies to regardless of Joey what you Pants. think about the second and third Matrix films, or even the other films that Wachowskis have done since. They're they're wonderful filmmakers. They know how to tell a good story. Like Cloud Atlas, I still love. Uh, uh, what is that? Jupiter Ascending, three and a half hour film, is a there's a four, like a five hour version of that film. of Cloud Atlas. Yeah, jeez, yeah, because it's an ad- impossible adaptation. Uh, Jupiter Ascending, I thought you know maybe the direction of trying to go for a uh, young adult style story wasn't the best one, but amazing action and incredible world building. Don't forget Speed Racer. Film. Of all their films, oh, I, I think love Speed Racer. That might, might have aged the best. Speed Racer. And then also Sense8. They did uh, a couple seasons of that on Netflix. And so they know how to push the limits of action, of visual storytelling, of real character-driven storytelling. And for them to go back, even if it's not exactly – like the, we've already been soured by two and three. Yeah. Right? People, for whatever reason, there are valid reasons, but you know, there's parts of it that they don't like. It's not – like people are happy with – the original Matrix being the one they treasure. You're not going to ever lose that. The one. Right? So I just want to go back to that world and yeah, have someone put money behind bring this back. And like you say, they are master filmmakers. They premeditate their shots like nobody. Like everything is drawn out to the pixel before they shoot it. And it's like exactly the film they wanted to make. Uh, would you need any of the original cast coming back? Yes. Keanu Cameo? I don't need uh, Lawrence Fishburne. Uh, Carrie Ann Moss. Ann Moss for sure. But she's dead. Yeah. Yeah. When did she die? Oh, she died right. She three. died she's in three. Th- oh, what a what a beautiful death. She was the only one who got to see the sun. Oh, that was sad. the only human who got to see who got to break through. Retcon it. The smog. Mm-hmm. Whatever. I don't think. You, I think maybe maybe Neo is the only cameo one you bring back. I don't think you need um, Cam Agent Smith. Can Mio? Can Neo? No. <laughs> I would want him in the uh, chair. What was the the dude with the white beard? What was he called? Oh, the, the architect? architect. Yeah, Neo's the new architect. Oh, yeah. that's funny. Popovich. Is he, is, he, is he evil now? <laughs> yeah, Greg Popovich. <laughs> evil Neo. Um, okay. I don't think they need to bring him back. Tell a new story you in know, that world. I, I, what do I know? Let the Wachowskis do what they yeah, want to yeah, do. Yeah. I yeah. will go see it. You have my money. Yes. You have my $12. Yeah, I'm, I would be more excited for that than Avatar 2. 
But they if they haven't started yet, yeah, they they only got so much time. All right, Keanu Reeves is getting old, or or maybe not. Have maybe you guys? Not old. There's another Netflix series I wanted to, sh- to mention, and that's I think you should leave with Tim Robinson. Have you guys seen this? I watched the first like episode. That's all you whatever need. you want to call you need. it. Yeah, it's crazy. Isn't it the weirdest thing you've ever seen? Uh, no, but it's getting up there. It is strange. And Tim Robinson, who like had a was a brief player on Saturday Night Live, never got to demonstrate this. No, this is totally out there. So, do you remember um, Too Many Cooks? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Like, what was that? That was weird, yeah. right? This is exactly like that, but it's a it's like a variety series. So they go from one segment to to the next. And it is just weird. It is the strangest comedy. Like you have people in a setting that seems completely normal and somebody will do something that is just socially awkward or uncomfortable and just odd, wrong. And you'll think, okay, that's, that's, that's funny. But then the world will embrace it and other people will start to jump in and contribute to the awkwardness. And it becomes, it just layers upon itself. And it's like, it's like a, Maybe not for the full family every episode, but it is, man, it is funny. Like, I am so glad this show exists. Mm-hmm. So I highly recommend it. Sketch show? Check it out. It's, it's, it's not sketch comedy in the traditional sense, but it is the same kind of format where they go from one sketch to the next. It's reminiscent of Mr. Show to me, um, but even weirder. It's so strange. It's wonderful. I, like it really tickles my sense of humor. It's a little bit dark, and it's definitely like there. It's not your traditional, you know, good-looking people making funny jokes. It is yeah. out there. Bold of Netflix to give it a shot. To, yeah, totally. All right, that does it for our pop culture segment. Before we move on to our next segment, I want to let you know that This Is Only a Test This Week is made possible with support from Triple Byte because applying to programming jobs sucks. You have to put in the right keywords in your resume. You spend hours and hours on phone screens and take-home projects, and that's assuming the company even responds to your application. Well, if you're a software engineer, Triple Byte can help. They work with over 400 top tech companies from big names like Dropbox and Adobe to exciting startups. You do one brief online interview with them, and if you do well, you get to go to straight to final interviews with the companies on their platform. It's like the common app for software engineers. Triple Byte does not look at your resume or where you went to school. All they care about is if you can code because self-taught people are amazing. You don't need a piece of paper. You are not defined by that diploma, by just that piece on your resume. You are your ability. Apply now at triplebyte.com slash test. That's triplebyte, B-Y-T-E, byte as in eight bits. And as a special offer for listeners of the show, if you take a job through Triplebyte, they'll offer you a $1,000 signing bonus. Again, that's triplebyte, B-Y-T-E, dot com slash test. So Google I.O. was last week, and we mentioned there was some hardware announced from the Pixel 3a to some home products. And have you seen these new Nest commercials, even though Nest is uh, was downplayed a little bit at Google I.O.? They have a really good tagline now. Um, there's a commercial with all these like Google Home-style devices with cameras, people chatting with each other, and he goes, you make your house a home, we'll make your home a Nest. Mm. Oh, I thought it was clever. Yeah. Good marketing, whatever. Uh, I'm surprised anyway, to hear you say Nest was downplayed. I thought it was pretty central to some of their the hardware. Brand? And, yeah, the brand. The brand, yeah. Uh, the technology's there. So uh, Android Q, though. Quiche? Uh, I downloaded the beta on my Pixel 3. Android Quiche? Uh, and, oh, nice. We talked about last week. There's no dessert. Is there a sweet quiche? Sweet quiche. That's your new nickname. There is, oh, please No. <laughs> No, I re- reject Savory that name. Quiche. I, Ooh, salty I'm, quiche. I am salty quiche. Salty if anything. quiche. Uh, yes, there are sweet quiches. Confirmed. Yeah, I am not one of them, but there are some out there. All right, Android quiche. Uh, I installed the beta. Uh, I think some of the criticism that's emerged about the gestures, which seems to be the the big component, uh, 
the criticisms are like it's a copy of of how Apple does gestures. And I've been using the gesture going back to Android well, Pi um, because you had an option to, to turn some of that gesture stuff on. So to me, it's not a giant shift in the user experience because it was already there in Pi for the most part, the swipe up from the bottom. Who cares if they copied it from iPhone? Like that's what phones do now. They're copy from each other. And the gesture seems to work fine. Um, I'm not a physical what the are for people who other Android yeah. users who may not be getting Q uh, just yet. So right now, uh, Android phones I, use of buttons on the bottom, and phones don't have buttons. A home button now. No, you bottom. get the little pill you have a thing. Bar right. You have a yeah. bar with three icons. Typically, uh, Android it's a menu button, a home button, and a back button. Uh, iPhone lost their home button with the iPhone 10, and what was replaced was a bar, a horizontal bar, that became their gesture bar, which is one of the best UI advances I think the iOS has come out with in the past five years. It is so intuitive. It works great. I wish it was on every phone. Dude, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know Do what you're not like smoking. <laughs> Have you given somebody who's not up on technology an iPhone 10 and told them to get to the home screen with an app already open? Swipe up from the bottom. They can't do it. Well, you learn it once. Yeah. It, I didn't say it was intuitive. I said, didn't? I, I said it was <laughs> Okay. It's one of the All right. best designed. Okay. And it's the animations are amazingly smooth. Uh, but to fulfill, uh, and, and now Android has that, has a bar at the bottom that has its own dedicated space. So does it on iOS, it kind of overlaps on top of whatever application you're using. The white bar will always be there. In Android, there's like a, like a designated area for it. Uh, but it also needs to fulfill the back button. And the back gesture is what's different because you can swipe in from the right yeah, it's or just from a, the left it's a side swipe. of the phone. There's no back button anymore? There's no back button. Crazy. And no, but now, iPhone never had iPhone a back button. doesn't have a back button. No, but Android always did. Yeah. iPhone has a version of the back button which pops up contextually in the top left-hand corner. But that's new to iPhone. That It is new. Totally I, new to iPhone. I will say this. This might be controversial. I, I have a Pixel 2 XL as well. Yeah. And uh, I find with the bigger phones, that gesture move to like swipe to the left or right is more natural than to try to find the back button at the bottom. Cool. So uh, to me, this gesture works especially as phone size increases. And then it's not like you're like that doesn't translate to the smaller phone either. What's what is your natural back button gesture? Do you swipe from the right I go in? Left. So thumb. you thumb 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 to the left. From the left to the right. No. From the right to the left. Right to the left. So you draw the arrow backwards. On iOS that would be counterintuitive because that would be like moving the cards yeah. forward. Forward in time. Yeah. So it's yeah. tough to wrap my my head I don't know. That. That's what the backspace button has always had that arrow going that direction. Yeah. <laughs> I guess there, there goes your big difference between Q and, and iOS. Still. Uh, other uh, new updates with uh, the Android or, or the Google uh, system. They just got uh, awarded, uh, or class action lawsuit just, just got awarded a lawsuit against Google. So people who bought the original, was it the Pixel? Was it Pixel 2? Um, I don't know about this. I think class up to action. five. I think uh, it's up to like five hundred dollars. What? You getting some money? I'm get. I'm rich. <laughs> yeah, Google. Here, let me let me pull this out. Faulty mic issues with the original Pixel phone. Some phones had defective microphones. Uh, Google is settling this class action lawsuit mm -hmm. that said that Google knowingly sold these phones with defective microphones. So once a court approves it. They could pay up to five hundred dollars to certain Pixel owners for a total settlement of about seven million dollars. So it's not going to be everyone. I'm and probably it, not going to be part of this class action because my original Pixel was destroyed uh, when the New England Patriots kicked that last field goal in the Super Bowl. <laughs> oh my God! Really? And I threw my phone in rage wow. at watching the Patriots win, and it may have hit something that cracked this the phone. Wow. If your pixel, if you bought a Pixel phone, the first Pixel or Pixel XL, and it was made before January fourth, twenty seventeen. Oh, I'm in. Then you could give take me cover money for my broken phone. By the lawsuit. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah. PC Mag also had a story out today about some of the uh, Android Q beta features. There's something called Safety Hub that not a lot of the features have sort of been enabled yet, but there's some indication they have something that is a car crash detection. 
um, component. Somehow, when you're in a car, which it, I think the accelerometer recognizes when you're in, can recognize when you're in the car. That's how right. You can infer that you're moving faster than people are walking or biking. Yeah, probably the stopping a stoplight. Android GPS. Auto has yep. the ability to turn on um, yep. in those situations, but um, they they somehow can detect a car crash. It's not mm-hmm. clear what happens on your phone when it detects you're in probably a car crash. Sound and deceleration. Well, but I mean, what does it do when you get into the car oh, crash? It's not mean, clear what, what the phone do? does in that situation. What does right. it log? I mean, it makes a lot of sense for uh, car share. It's like Uber has this feature probably built into their app or Lyft in, into, for drivers, right? Because their apps are open all the time. They're tracking all that data, and it knows probably when any of these Ubers get into a fender better. Mm. Yeah. I think for insurance purposes, like wouldn't an insurance company want this? Gives you right. a, like a clear timestamp of when an accident potentially happened. And also what you were doing on your phone, by the way. Ah, there you go. No. Was, there, was there a user interaction in the now last we're getting five seconds? Some weird ten privacy seconds? No, you, you're Territory. the one that said wouldn't insurance like to see it. Uh, I, I wonder what the false positives on something like that looks like. Because that, I mean, is dropping your phone Throwing your phone in the car when Tom Brady scores a winning touchdown. Will that uh, trigger some false incidents here? I don't know. Triggers. You got triggered. Oh, I got that got super <laughs> triggered. Um, uh, the other Android Q stuff that has come out, like darker mode and some of the well-being stuff, I haven't played around much with um, at this point, but it doesn't seem like a huge iteration from Pi to me. But I can say more in in about a week when I've played around with the beta more. People expect iOS to get dark mode at this year's update, mm. which I would use. I like dark mode. Makes a lot of sense for OLED screens. Yeah, they actually say it makes a battery savings as well as saving the, the screen itself. Yeah. I don't see why that's such a big deal because the people that really want dark mode, like mm-hmm. you can install launchers in Android at least uh, uh, that give you dark mode now before this update happens. So it's yeah, not like... We, a, we don't have that. Oh, yeah. Tear for you. I know. All right, pivoting over to screen. the Apple news. Uh, we've got some Apple Pay news. Um, what's what's going on with NFC? Well, you know how Apple Pay, you normally you go up to the cash register and you hold your phone up to the credit card uh, swiper? Yes. That's great and all, but starting now, uh, Apple has allowed you to use simple NFC stickers to initiate a, uh, a the payment. the receiving side? No, no, no. Like, it's all still done on the phone, but you'll just put, like, these stickers that cost nothing. Like, they cost pennies to make. You put the right code onto the sticker, which you can do, like, very, very easily, and then you put the sticker on something that you want to sell, and you can sell it using Apple Pay. You think some nefarious people could use this for ill? Well, it's not like it charges you if you scan it. It just brings up the thing yeah. on your phone. It says, okay, now tap your button twice if you want to pay six ninety five. So that's, I think that's great. Um, it's sort of like just like Apple's finding all new ways to use Apple Pay. Um, so I, I actually think that's a, that's a good thing. They're also partnering with Bird Scooters. So you'll mm. be able to pay using Apple Pay when you go to one of those scooters. Uh, are they going to put off. this NFC sticker on it? That's, that's some people are assuming that, but it might be built into the scooter. They got mm. a little more money. I totally could see nefarious implications for this, people overriding the NFC sticker with their own stickers, receiving payment when people didn't expect that you were buying that thing. But you still got to prove it. Right. But if you... Oh, you're saying like they, maybe they think they're buying it from somebody else. Yeah. Ooh. And then instead you're bypassing it yeah. with a middleman with a, a, a fake sticker. It'll be interesting to see what you need to write onto these NFC tags right. to initiate this. Yeah. Fake Q, it's like a fake barcode. You know? it's yeah. It's a different, different barcode. Or a barcode that is like the point of sale. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Well, future uh there's a new that tv app that apple talked about is now out uh, has, have either of you installed it uh i installed the update i haven't actually taken a look at the app so the, the update came with uh, what was it, like 10.3 or something 12.3 thank yeah. you oh, wow. 12 and it's now embedded on on phone so if you install the update you got a brand new tv app and the, the big news is that it comes with channels this new concept of channels which uh is apple um, aggregating all of the services like HBO and Showtime, and you'll be able to pay for those services using Apple Pay once again. So it's now Apple is officially a cable company. But it's 
it's just repackaging those apps. Yeah, but you're not paying for those apps to those people anymore. But like you, you're you paying used to for them, do them through Apple. You used to do that through Apple as well, and Apple would take their cut. It's just an easier way, a more streamlined way. Is that true? Yeah. You could pay for HBO and Showtime and all that stuff using Apple? Using just sign Apple. in using your Apple account? Yep. And that's oh. how you restore purchases with the iTunes. Oh, okay. Why? Some some wouldn't, like Amazon wouldn't let you do it because they never yeah. wanted to let Apple take a cut and you'd have to sign up elsewhere and then log in elsewhere with right. for code. This is, again, just making it as easy as possible for people for those services. Apple wants to make be a big services company to just say yes to my iTunes account and add it to my big iTunes bill at the end of the month. And it goes to all of your family sharing if you use that so everybody gets the same services and it's on um, Apple TV, obviously. And it's coming to, to computers to iOS 10 later this year. As a bit of a tangent, speaking of family sharing, you hear about the big kerfuffle with Spotify family sharing? No. So apparently Spotify has family sharing, and the way they, uh, uh, the way they uh, verify it is with address, because mm. it's under one household. But uh, if your family member types in, you know, signs in and, and types in an address, and you mistype with wrong capital letter, different spacing, not the exact address, uh, they won't verify it. And it's and and you might not know what address you originally typed in for your the way you spelled out you know your address yeah. uh, when you signed up. So they make it very difficult. Okay. Intentionally almost to to get family sharing working. Which apparently isn't the case with Apple Music. Odd. Yeah. One last note about this uh, channels thing is that it's the only place where you can download HBO shows. So you could download oh. for offline viewing. Right, right. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Oh, I, I bet they're still the same relatively low bit rate as yeah, the streaming. I would imagine so the same thing. Your, your Game of Thrones isn't going to look any better, unfortunately. Um, Apple is not expected to put 5G in this year's new iPhone. And Why? I've already got 5G. It says right on my screen. The, does it? On Five, your AT&T? 5GE, yeah. Oh, 5G Evolution. Yeah. That's right. Does it really say that on your screen? It did when I, yeah, wherever I was this weekend. Really? Yep. Oh, it's gross. You don't get that? No, I'm a Verizon. They, oh. they really want to charge you for real 5G. Yeah. It doesn't now for some reason. Well, we have terrible reception at the office. So uh, the expectation is not this year, maybe next year, but the whole plan was that Apple would be making their own radios. One of the points of contention of, of them and Qualcomm and, and licensing the 5G chips. But... Uh, when they were not using Qualcomm chips, they were using Intel chips, and Intel has stopped making, have stopped, stopped pursuing a 5G radio business for smartphones, and there was a talk of Apple potentially wanting to buy that business. That deal fell through. They did eventually settle with Qualcomm. Apple's going to give them a ton of money and also a licensing deal to use Qualcomm. So if 5G comes on Apple's phones next year, it will be through Qualcomm. Okay. Not ideal for Apple. They still want to make their chips. But the latest report is that their own 5G radios probably won't come until 2025 at the earliest. Apple's on this slow trek toward making all of the hardware, fabbing all of the chips inside their phones, not relying on third parties. And the big thing is processor and also the radio. Six years is a long time, man. Isn't, how far is that into, you know, into the 5G life cycle? Well... I think 5G is going to be around for a long time. I don't think we're going to get widespread 5G at reasonable prices for at least two years. Okay. I mean, okay. I mean, I assume. I mean, obviously, the the Qualcomm will be just as good. I, I think when we look at 5G rollout, it's not going to be like 3G. It's not going to be like LTE. Those were big jumps. 5G is a massively big jump, and all the telecom companies are seeing it as a huge money making opportunity. And so it will be more akin to maybe like the rollout of fiber in terms of like high prices mm -hmm. and, and, and the difference between that and I wonder if they're going to position it as not just 5G, but basically your home internet. Yeah, no, they, they are. It, they, they think it's, you know, it, once infrastructure set up, that this will be the standard for a very, very long time. And, you know, the, the things you can do on it, we'll, we'll just think about data usage differently and latency differently, and wireless always connected differently. Uh, moving on to other products, uh, DJI, maker of drones, uh, is now moving into the action camera business. Their new Osmo Action 
It was just launched today. And this is evolution off of, pretty, pretty logical evolution off of what they had previously been doing with their Osmo cameras, which was their gimbaled stabilized camera systems, handheld stabilized camera systems, using the same uh, lens and sensors that were on their drones. This Osmo Action doesn't have a gimbal. It is its own self-contained camera. It looks very much like your GoPro style format with a couple differences. Uh, one being uh, it has a screen on not only the back like the Hero 7 does, but also on the front as well. A LCD, is it LCD or OLED? A color display on the front that lets you do selfies for video because it makes a lot of sense. People film themselves using these cameras all the time. They put them on sticks and have a nice looking uh, display in the front. Um, LED display, so LCD display on the front uh, makes sense. And then also the lens is really big and so it's also um, interchangeable uh, in terms of filters and aftermarket accessories. Mm -hmm. How does the feature set compare to GoPros? Uh, we're all still talking about 4K, 60 FPS. You can do slow motion. There's uh, digital stabilization, uh, which apparently is very good on, on both the, the cameras. Uh, there's no GPS on the Osmo Action and um, no editing, limited editing on the apps. But for people who just want to film, get good quality video and share, uh, the reviews that have come out today have said it's been really good. Um, it does 4K 60 and 12 megapixel photos. Waterproof, all that jazz. Same style mount, I would assume, as a GoPro? Uh, with a quarter inch. Yeah. Yeah, screw mount on the bottom. Yes. Uh, although GoPro doesn't have, GoPro has their own, you buy you buy your accessory, you buy your case, and then the case goes onto it. GoPro's all about. The, the upsell? Part. Upsell, upsell those mounts. Yeah. Um, Alexa. Oh, I should have oh, said you that. What'd you do? So sorry. What'd you do? I'm so sorry. I'm so, cancel. There we are. Uh, so there's a new feature that rolled out yesterday, today, yesterday, and uh, it's called the name that I just said, Guard. And the idea is the device will listen for smoke detectors going off, any kind of beeping thing, maybe it's a carbon monoxide detector, and the sound of breaking glass. And if it hears either one of those, it will alert you to your phone. And so... I suppose theoretically that's a good thing. And it can send you the audio that it recorded of the breaking glass or the smoke detector. Is it just the echoes or is it going to be the rings as well? I th uh, That's a good question. It's, what's the ring? The ring doorbell. Oh, I, th I think it's just the, the echoes. Because I, I would think like the ring, if they're doing yeah. sound monitoring as well, would ha add a lot of value to this. To but have it's outside. Like yeah, but you know, if could you have be at glass your front door, or right? at your door, it's yeah. possible. It's possible. You're right. That's a good point. Uh, but it's uh, it's neat. So you you set it up in the app in your phone. I set it up this morning. And uh, do you need me to come by and break a window? Yeah, we need to test this stat. Well, we can just bring in a separate piece of glass. I guess we need a lot of pieces of glass, and then we can go at several distances, so right? Like right up to it, mm -hmm. around the corner, upstairs. Let's get a bucket and a couple pieces of safety glass. Bring, and I'll just bring my car and like leave it on in your garage for a little while. Test out the carbon monoxide detector. I don't know. For me, it's like it's interesting. And then you turn it on for uh, when you leave by just saying, you know, device, I'm leaving. And then, you know, she'll say, okay, I got your back. Uh, guard will turn on. But like, what do you do if you get that notification? It's just like a you just freak out. Like, because you can't do anything. It's like that Allstate ad, right? With the the guy that's on his ring camera or whatever security camera and you have the the actor that plays like a, I'm a I'm a car thief. I'm breaking into your car. You yeah. No, what do you what can you do? You, I guess you I mean, I guess you go home. Yeah. You could call a neighbor. Yep. But I mean, it just it's you can call a, the police if yeah, you I, see something. I suppose calling the police is a good idea. But what do you say? Like, uh, I got a recording from my Amazon device of a piece of glass breaking. Could you go check my house out? I mean, you got to rewind the clock and say like two years ago, they're getting messages like my smart doorbell just alerted me to a package <laughs> thief, right? Yeah, so, does this record? Like if it hears the sound? That's what I'm saying. It'll send you the audio. It sends you audio like of... Of the, of the crash. But it will record like five minutes after. Oh, I don't know about that. Right? Because if there's a setting for you, like hear yeah. the crash and then like... Or to get like a live feed. Right. 
Right, like start activating your your rec- like you know you buy really cheap webcams that yeah. you can start recording on. Right, but even the, there's a microphone there. Why wouldn't there be an option that at least store on your local account? Maybe not necessarily send to Amazon. Yeah, sure. But send an account the next ten minutes in case whoever breaks in starts giving information. Oh, that's a good idea. Right, you of can who get they your are. stuff back. Yeah. yeah, I like that. That's an interesting idea. Yeah, I don't know. It also, if it's connected to any smart lights, it will control them so that if you're gone, it knows you are because you told it you were leaving. Mm. It will use the, you know, the time of day to adjust them and make it look like you're home. I wonder if that's randomized. Yeah, it like it, so it's be. not the same every day. Because right. you got the guys from Home Alone sitting out front. You don't exactly. want the light going on at the no. exact same hour. Right, it's the modern version of that where Joe Pesci like, break the glass. Hmm, it was exactly 4.2 seconds for lights to come on. That is <laughs> the, the guard trigger time. Right. They are definitely not home. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a neat feature. Yeah. I think it could use some expanding. Yeah. A um, couple more stories. Adobe has a new Lightroom update for Lightroom Classic, Lightroom Mobile. I'm a big fan of Lightroom on all of the platforms, including mobile, really fast on tablets now and phones. And they added in a new slider for the first time in a while. It's the texture tool. Now, there's a big blog post from one of their engineers talking about exactly what they did to make this tool. It's basically a version of like the clarity tool or the sharpening tool, but specifically designed for skin textures. If you want to basically think of, there's a softening that you can do. A lot of people like softening their photos to remove blemishes. This increases the texture uh, of of those surfaces, uh, which is a really neat thing. Again, it's worth trying. It's a free update if you're going to subscribe to Adobe Creative Cloud. Uh, One plus. Isn't there an open, or is it closed? There's a beta for iOS Photoshop. Photoshop, yeah. yes, which is different than Lightroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you interested in that? Less so, because all, you know, growing up, Photoshop was a way to edit photos and, and graphic images, and I'm not a graphic designer, so while I open Photoshop when I want to do, like, logo tweaking and stuff like that, I'm more in Lightroom now, because everything, hmm. the camera raw stuff yeah. is all in, in Lightroom, and really, you have more photos now than ever. And they're all on your phone, and Lightroom Mobile works. Do you shoot well. raw on this? Yes, you do. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, the um, Halide app. Um. So, uh, oh, OnePlus. Other phone news. So, OnePlus makes was well, for a long time made relatively affordable high-end Android phones, and their newest phone, the OnePlus Seven Pro. And I can't believe we're on the seventh one. Was just announced. Uh, this week with a big event, we're hopefully going to get one into review. This one looks to be a real winner. Mm-hmm. So, first of all, edge to edge screen. Okay. They call it notchless, almost bezel-less. It's a very tiny bezel, curved, very much like the Galaxy Edge and curved on both sides. Uh, 1440 resolution, so 2560 by 1440 OLED. And... 90 hertz screen. OLED okay. screen. So not 120 that you've seen on previous like uh, Razer phone or 120 LCD. 90 makes a lot of sense because the panels are out there. We had on VR displays for a long time. 90 hertz OLED. Probably consume a little more power. Very fast processor. Latest processor. I believe it's a... Uh, who makes this? Ooh, I do not know who makes this. Um, notchless because it has a pop-up camera. Oh. I'm unsold on the pop-up camera. What's that mean? Because that's like mechanics that can go wrong. It's like on the top of the phone, the, the selfie camera yeah. p- pops up, like an yeah. old flash on a on a portable on a, on a camera. Yeah, but is it like pop up like direct? Like, and pops then you, up directly And up. you push it back and in? push it back in. And they did a demo where uh, when it was popped up, hmm. it's secure enough that it could hold like... 40 pounds. Oh, that's smart. Okay. Uh, $670. T-Mobile and Verizon in the U.S. I thought this was supposed to be the affordable phone. Well, that's the other story with this, is now that we're in the realm of $1,000 phones, Mm. OnePlus feels like they can put out a $670 phone, which is, for the specs, very affordable compared to, you know, Galaxy, your flagships Mm. um, on on the Android side. And it has, it has all the speed. It has this 90 hertz display. It has you know your notchless front. It has a bunch of nice cameras on the back. It runs a very uh, uh, smooth version of uh, Android OS. And 
I is think it we're gonna stock into Android it. OS? Like, it's so it's that's, not stock Android. Is it their oxygen or whatever? It is, it is their oxygen. So OS. I think that's one complaint that has historically come down is that uh, updates on their own OS have been slower, especially security patches. Uh, two, battery is always a concern with the OnePlus phones. They typically haven't had the same battery life. And then a camera has always been an issue. The cameras have never kind of measured up. And this pop-up camera is kind of interesting, but the only way you're going to get it is through real-life testing. Some of the initial reviews that I read, like Engadget had a review this morning that was pretty positive about the camera and the and the photos, but uh, I think that's a real-world situation that we need mm. to see. Uh, 3120 by 1440, so much higher resolution than I thought. Uh, and also 8-core Qualcomm Snapdragon 855. Oh, so 855. Very fast. That is isn't one of the later yeah, models. 120 gigs of storage, 6 gigs of RAM at the base price. No headphone jack. Oh, Jeremy's out. Christ. Yeah. But can we be serious about this? This is a serious issue. Well, Pixel brought it back last week for I you. Know. you go, go, the you, little guy. If guys. you want an affordable phone, go get a 3A. You got night, night vision or night view. Uh, Boosted is putting out an electric... S- not skateboard? What is this? Scooter? <laughs> yeah. It's the Boosted Rev. This is hot off the presses. We sat down to do this podcast, and Kishore said, what about the new Boosted scooter I read about this morning? This is called the Boosted Rev, and it looks like there's only one SKU. It's a $1,600 electric scooter. Ooh. You, but, you've done electric You've had electric scooters. Yes. And, you know, you can get them on Amazon for a third this price, mm-hmm. but nowhere near the power. So I'm... This is a sweet looking electric scooter. It's got two motors. It does. There's only one skew. It's a dual motor skew. So so each of the of the wheels, and this is like to to say scooter, like some people might think Vespa. No, it's like a stand up kick scooter. But it's there's, a powered razor. Yes, it's a powered razor. And each of the wheels have motors built into them. I assume that the battery is underneath the, the kick the, the part that you stand on. And it's a 24 mile an hour top speed, which is on par with their their new hottest skateboard. Hmm. 22 mile range. Yeah, which and is we'll great. And will go up inclines. Yeah, it will go up. Uh, what what grade incline are they saying? Like, 25 degrees. That's pretty good. So uh, I am. So this is the intrigued. Sco- this is the scooter. If you look at, if you're basically looking at other people on scooters, and you're like, I'm gonna drag them off the red light. I'm just gonna smoke them. At yep. 22 miles an hour. Uh, so you've used electric skateboards. You know, yep. Adam's a big fan of the one wheel. Uh, where do you see people making the distinction between wanting to pay over $1,000 for an electric skateboard versus an electric scooter? You know, this is more, I think it's more of like an alternative to public transportation and cars. I think a lot of people are moving around the city on their last mile vehicles now just to get just to commute. But they're doing that on their electric skateboards already. Well, yeah, but some people aren't comfortable in electric skateboards. So this is purely a comfort thing, like, having a handle, yeah. having the stock. This is something that my kids could ride with comfort, and mm. I'd be much more comfortable with them riding it. And a lot of people aren't going to touch a skateboard just because there's a lot of balancing involved. And that Bluetooth controller, while they've improved it a ton, is not 100% bulletproof. This is direct analog. So yes, a little wheel connection. that you, you, you had a flick with your thumb yep. to speed up speed down uh it's f- almost 50 pounds 46 pounds so this doesn't feel like a thing that you're going to put in the back of your car drive somewhere take out and and or, or maybe you will i don't know but it's like it sounds like you store it at home go on go on the ride yep um, it's got a front headlight a rear brake light oh okay uh yeah it looks i don't can, know can you cool. attach a basket to it for groceries I don't know. Mine has a hook on the front that you can hang groceries from. Uh, I don't know what they have here. Hmm. That's a good question. Three hours to recharge. Anything. So that's good. reasonable. That's it, reasonable for work. I'm yeah. surprised it took them so long to make a scooter. They've been top of the game for uh, skateboards for a while, but they have a lot more competition now than they used to. Yeah, yeah. They're. I think uh, these companies are going to really differentiate themselves on their motor controller. You know, the, you can buy a lot of generic scooters with high capacity batteries with just as strong motors, but it's really that drive system for responsiveness, for reliability, yeah. um, and efficiency and, and power drain that differentiates these to make these a, a premium product. It's good to know. If you're going to get one, we'd love to have you test it, Jeremy. Thanks, Norm. I'll let you know. All right. Uh, a new experimental product announced this week from a Lenovo. 
they have no name for it. We did a video of this on the site this week. It's They're tentatively calling it a foldable PC, the world's first foldable PC. And let's get all the jokes out of the way. A foldable PC is a laptop. The big difference here, there is no physical keyboard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it is a single screen that folds in half. So what do you type? Like you got a, you need a Bluetooth keyboard? And you can have a, they will include a Bluetooth keyboard. Or on screen, I assume. Or an on screen keyboard. And it uses the first consumer mass market consumer device. It's under the third ThinkPad brand, but will use a flexible LG display, 13.3 inch mm-hmm. OLED, this flexible OLED, with of course a different, you know, than a graphene cover. It's going to be a soft, flexible film as the the screen. So we got to use one of the few prototypes they had, and it's trippy. You can, it, it, you know, the size of you basically take a 13.3 inch laptop and you take the top off it's kind of like what you would have on uh, the uh, top of a surface book and fold it in half bend it in half on a hinge uh, now the hinge they wouldn't let us get close up photos of how the hinge works they're calling it a torque hinge but it did stay rigid across the entire range of movement on it so it can be folded out so they flat. didn't let you hold it no I could hold it I just couldn't get photos or video at the hinge itself, um, but when it folds all the way in, it doesn't fold flat. There's a little bit of a radius, also like on the Surface Book, which they said helps preserve the lifespan of the display. We saw that um, a lot of the foldable screens at CES had that same- Little uh, radius? Yeah, little yeah. radius. Is that, this the future? I think this is the first step in the future. I, I bet it's gonna be expensive. They're calling it a pre- premium product. It's gonna run full x86. You know, likely a 10 nanometer Intel chip, although they wouldn't confirm, they would just say next gen Intel. Probably won't be as capable as a full fledged, you know, U class, Intel U class chip laptop. It's kind of running the Y series, kind of like a Core M, Core, Core, Core M3 uh, class, is my guess. Uh, How heavy was it? Now, they would not let us weigh it. They don't have a target weight yet. They said it would be under two pounds, what it's aiming for. I think if it's at two pounds, it's going to be too heavy. I think I don't think it's going to be as low as one pound. I'm hoping it's in the 1.5, 1.6 pound range, which is the size, the, the weight of a, a book, you know, paperback book. I don't, I don't know. Like so, it's both really exciting and weird. I don't know if this is a product that initially people are going to buy. Like get, Samsung, crazy, expecting people, a million people, to buy Galaxy Fold phones, two thousand dollar phone this year. I bet it's going to be a premium product because it's kind of first-gen technology at this point, but it's going to set the stage for a new type of form factor of a single device that can actually be your tablet and a laptop and have a small enough footprint that you actually take it with you everywhere. Well, Apple wants the tablet to be the laptop. They have had, you actually have turned into somebody who appreciates their keyboard case. I love the keyboard case. And you use it to type and to perform productivity. Yep. Uh, That iPad. Yeah. And so this is a bigger screen, I guess. This is, think of the difference. I'm going to put it in terms that Apple fans will will appreciate. Why was the iPad mini more appealing than the iPad, full-size iPad or iPad Pro? It's Um, portability. Yeah. Well, it it just feels good in in one hand. It feels good in one hand, and you're more likely to take it with you different places and use it probably because of its size, mm-hmm. essentially, right? This one folded up. You can't use the screen when it's folded up. It, it's kind of like you close your folio, close your book, it is like the size of an iPad mini, you know, 9.7 inch long diagonal. Right. Um, which means I, I was holding it around, walking around the room folded up. It was super comfortable, super portable. Yeah. And then the fact that when you want to use it, you can fold it in half and use it as like, in a you know a laptop style use case, fine. But when you fold it fully out, it becomes a you know thirteen point three inch four by three aspect ratio canvas that you can you then use their Wacom pen on. It's basically having the best of both worlds of something as portable as an iPad Mini, but as large as an iPad Pro when fully used. Fully I'm still expanded. having 
um, challenges envisioning like when it's sort of half folded, yeah. like a book, yeah. what the use cases are because it's essentially operating as one two, sc- uh, two screens that but you Windows can only drag. sees it as one screen. That's, yeah. that's the thing. So they also did not indicate which version of Windows this would run on, and the theory is that it will run on what people are calling Windows Lite, which is a version of Windows 10 coming out that's going to be a stripped down version for tablets um, that Microsoft has not announced yet officially, uh, but the expectation is it'll come out later this year. So if that can recognize when the fold happens, that the bottom becomes an actual useful keyboard and you're using half the top screen as your you know, web browser or you have your, you know, your, it's Windows, so you can stack your Windows as however you want them. Um, I agree. Like when it's folded, it's kind of like a book format. It's like you're, it's an e-reader that you have an angle. And the viewing angles are unproven for these type of displays at that kind of, at, at you know weird angles. Uh, I see it more as a large screen that you can then take with you anywhere. Yeah. Is it is that really a problem? It's I don't not, think it's a problem. It just offers a, a yeah. different convenience. It's not something that we always saw in sci-fi films and said, "Oh, I can't wait for that!" Like, give me that, and oh, we finally have it. Like, what I want is the weird laser the vol- projector that just projects holograms oh. above my device. You're, you're, or I want the glasses that are augmented reality and they turn my world into whatever I want it to be. If if, if we're to project forward uh, and talk about where these displays will be used and what type of devices. The batteries hopefully will get more efficient, and the chips will get smaller. If you look at the iPhone, it's mostly battery, and the processor is a very tiny. The chipset, the motherboard is like size of a stick of gum, right? Um, the foldable displays eventually will get thin enough where you're going to have your notch area be where the processor, maybe the battery is, the battery mm-hmm. is maybe thin enough, and these will be super thin, and they'll basically be the size of, you know, your Mead notebooks, if that. Mm-hmm. Or a folder. Uh, I don't think it'll be rollable. Maybe not like newspaper thin, but they're going to be as portable as a journalist notebook that then you can fold out and have a big screen. Because you're going to want the big screen. Your dream of a holographic world is going to come, and this will complement that. But I think people are still going to want tangible screens that you can pass around and and look at. Like Magic will tell you, we're going to live in this live in a screenless world because. We're all gonna be synced up, and mm-hmm. the virtual piece of flat piece of paper that we're gonna pass along to each other will will just see that same content, perfectly projected and perfect no, I get viewing it. angles. I get it. But for now, we do have tablets. We have the wonderful iPad line that comes yeah. in all different sizes. They're just not foldable, and I'm wondering, They're like, just not as portable. If I d- if I could have a foldable iPad Pro, which I suppose would be like the the grand vision. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that interests me because I I would be annoyed by that fold. Like, well, it, it, well, let's put it this way. If the Dream Tech was available and I got here, I got my iPad Pro and I had the option to make it more compact by folding it in half yeah. and that wouldn't damage the screen, mm-hmm. I'd take that in a heartbeat. You would? If okay. it wouldn't damage the screen right. and I get the same quality of experience, because I, of course I want something with a smaller footprint. The iPad Pro is not... It, it, as long as you can't tell that it folds when it's unfolded. And you can't with oh. this one. Wow. You cannot. Really? And when it folds out, you do not see a crease at all watch the video it'll be it interesting is, it is to a see completely if... i mean this is the thing that i think they're selling me on with LG, with the flexible displays is that yes they can fold and yes you know when they folded there may be weird viewing angles and and contrast but when it's unfolded mm-hmm. it reads as one continuous giant display that's important all right so it'll be interesting to see if upon repeated folding and manipulation that it maintains yeah. that illusion. Yes. Yeah, yeah, lifespan. And hopefully we're, they're not designing these products to be disposable with like with just, you know, not 10 years of use, not five years of use, but like three years of use. Planned obsolescence of I, a device? Yeah. Who would do yeah. such a thing? Someone will figure that out one day. And, and make a business out of it. <laughs> Services. It's all rental. Products for rent. All right, that does it for technology news this week. Before we move on, I want to let you know that this is only a test this week. is also made possible by Netgear's Wi-Fi 6 routers. Upgrade your smartphone, TV, and laptop. Uh, You upgrade that on a regular basis, but when's the last time you upgraded your home Wi-Fi? The future of Wi-Fi is here, and it's time to welcome Wi-Fi 
6. The Netgear Nighthawk Wi-Fi 6 router gives you ultra-fast speeds and wider coverage throughout your home. It's the biggest revolution in Wi-Fi ever. You get four times the capacity compared to today's Wi-Fi, which means you can connect more devices and stream simultaneously without impacting Wi-Fi speed and reliability. Devices of today and tomorrow demand more. Your old Wi-Fi is timing out, and you need the latest and high-performance Wi-Fi that can keep up with you and your entire family. If you stream your shows on services like Netflix or Hulu, the latest line of high-performance routers from Netgear will eliminate buffering and let you stream smoothly. Even in 4K, it's like giving your streaming the VIP treatment. And if you game online, lag will be a thing of the past. Turn your Wi-Fi up to 6 with a Nighthawk Wi-Fi 6 router. Check it out today at netgear.com slash Wi-Fi 6. Again, that's netgear.com slash Wi-Fi and the number 6. Now it's time for a moment of science. I think we covered this story maybe a month ago. There's a museum in Florida, a Dali museum. Yeah. That has... St. Petersburg. Yes, that's right. That has a... Is it St. Petersburg, Florida? Yeah, I've been there. I've been uh-huh. to this museum. The That has a virtual AI-generated fake Salvador Dali. Wait, do you mean real time? Or is it pre-recorded? Pre-recorded. It was pre-recorded. Okay. Uh, interact with you. And says things that the real Salvador Dali never said. Welcome, like, A, welcoming you to St. Petersburg, Florida, maybe. Yeah. Uh, And this idea of, like, generating a a deep fake that is so believable uh, is sort of an interesting idea. Like, how does an an AI do that? And you can think of some adversarial outcomes for something like this, where a deep fake AI is designed to... Just absolutely fool you yeah. in a way that is detrimental. Yeah, people have shown examples of that, of Obama saying things he never said. Right. So how do we combat that? There's been, We've covered stories in the past about looking for uh, items and in, in these different deep fakes in the back of the pictures that doesn't line up. Well, now there's researchers that are training AIs to fight against the bad AIs. Oh, yeah. It, like we're in full Skynet mode, I feel like, yeah. a little bit. Um, and... Uh, One of the things they looked at, and a paper came out from a set of scientists from MIT and some other places, they looked at the training algorithms for AIs when they look particularly at at pictures. And they gave them some basic information, like here's a picture of a dog and a cat. But the dog picture they gave, you can just choose any dog picture. And sometimes there's dogs that have hair-like features in the micro version that make them appear cat-like to an AI. But to us, it'll just appear like a dog because we see the macro version. But the AI is seeing all of the data down deep in the picture. Then they intentionally mislabeled the picture. So they told the AI that this picture of a dog that has cat-like features was a cat. And so they tried to essentially like trick the AI that was identifying this. This shit's going to be illegal one day. <laughs> it's right out of the Neil Stephenson book. Where it, it gets kind of interesting. They were able to essentially identify the features in these pictures that were allowing the AI to be fooled. And then generated images that were essentially of a dog that the AI wouldn't be fooled by anymore. So they took out these features and they don't look right to us Mm. as fundamental. So if you look at the the link there, you can see the image of the original dog and a crab and a duck they generated on the top row um, that was able to be faked and fool the AI. And then down below was images of a dog, crab and a duck that they essentially constructed to train the AI that allowed it not to be faked in the same way. It was very interesting how they have to, what we're doing is essentially retraining our AI algorithms. Did they apologize? Why would they apologize? To the AI. For for tricking it. It doesn't have feelings. Yeah. Does it though? Jesus. He said it, not me. Does, (laughs) you don't have feelings. You don't. Wow, they're, they're going to scrub through YouTube and, and pick up. This I'm going to get one of those one of those guard alerts right now. Your house is being broken into. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, anyways, the paper on this, I think, is, is totally fascinating. It ties really well into some of that deep fake stuff we, we've talked about. The Dali stuff, I think, is super cool. It's it's live now, and there's a behind-the-scenes video talking about how they trained uh, the animation, the animators, to, to do that um, because they – there was a separate body performer versus the the facial animation, mm-hmm. and they picked out a video. And the good thing there was a repository of film from Dali that they could then identify it and help train the AI system. Like this is what he looked like when he's saying these words, and uh, and then scripted it. And the display itself is a life size display, so he, like he walks toward you know the the, the window hmm. as it were, and it has a conversation with you with like tons of dialogue options. At the end, the big surprise is that it takes a selfie with you. It's a super cool little thing where the the animation holds up a you know virtual uh, a, a, a camera, yeah. the iPhone, turns around, and then they they have a camera on the win- on the the uh, kiosk, and you see the picture moving in real time on the phone. Of the selfie. That's cool. And then they take the picture, and Dali is in the corner of the picture as if he's in the room with he's you. He's looking away from you into the camera. Into the camera. That's cool. And it's different expressions, and then they email you that picture, and you got a selfie that he took, yeah. of Dali, virtual Dali took, uh, of you. I dare say he would have liked that. I, I think that's kind of the, the point of this, the, 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 the surreal immortality of it all. Um, which also goes back to a story of if you guys, and we're not going to talk super in depth about Endgame, but uh, <laughs> the spoiler ban what? has been lifted by Marvel. Oh, that's and right. And so there are a ton of spoilers, a ton of behind the scenes pictures and videos. There's commercials that now that I spoil know, the movie. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I, I, I did, noticed that. I did not like that. Uh, and the FX stories are starting to come out. The behind the scenes stories of how they made the film. And FX Guide has this wonderful... Uh, feature piece, two-part feature piece about the CG characters, one being Hulk and one being Thanos. And for Thanos, uh, it was a combination of work between ILM, or uh, sorry, Weta Digital and Digital Domain. They talked about how the facial animation for Thanos, which they developed through their work on things like even like Avatar and Avatar 2 and things like Battle Angel Alita and... Lord of the Rings, I would imagine. Oh, much, much more advanced than that. You know, they, there's always a reference of like Gollum's eyes had like fifty thousand polygons, and like Battle Angel and Thanos' eyes have like millions of polygons. Yeah, but it's the performance capture that, right? And and now the new performance capture systems are so much more advanced. Um, and Did it, you see the capture of Josh Brolin's face with with the dots on it? The too? dots are so. There's the tracking markers aren't just like individual dots it's like his entire face is covered with hmm. dots many more dots and they're saying they train the systems now there's some training there's some neural network uh, you know some learning deep learning but they really want to give animators full control as well and they really want to use the performance of the base and make sure the performance works here's the one thing that shocked me one they never want to do ADR for facial stuff they never want to have the body performance be one thing and then redo the face later on mm. because they feel like the face and the body need to be tied together. It's almost completely opposite of what like the Dali thing we're talking about. The one performer needs to do both because subtle muscle movements on the face ripple through your body and vice versa. Also, people, the, the, the facial markers are different every day, every time you apply them. And so what they did is you apply the facial markers and they train for that day the system to map onto an animated rig, and they first made that rig a virtual Josh Brolin first. They didn't map immediately these dots to Thanos. They want, they created a virtual Josh Brolin, mapped the face, the dots on real Josh Brolin's and facial capture to virtual Josh Brolin to make sure that it was one-to-one. Hmm. And once they did that one-to-one, then they reapplied the virtual Josh Brolin to virtual Thanos. Which makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, it it explains why he has depth of facial feature, though. And then when you see the side by side comparisons to Josh Brolin making like big smile faces, like frowns and stuff, you see that reflected uh, in the actual acting of of the character. Uh, I don't know. Is this going to be the new normal, or is this just for the super high end films? That we're going to see this tech. I think it's super high-end films. I think there are a lot of shortcuts that that f- for more budget-conscious films they can do. 
with kind of procedurally figuring out and smoothing out the animations. And there was some smoothing out. You know, there some, they talked about how uh, the edge of the lips is in a place that's tracked really well. So they had to, you know, kind of guess where that is. They also do some uh, deep learning when the face is occluded. You know, when you have an actor rub their eyes or their hands, you lose, there's occlusion. Yeah. For, or when their face is turned away, you know, face buried in a pillow or something. Mm. Um, so that stuff is all super interesting. And it just, it sounds like a problem that isn't solved yet. The digitalization, the virtualization of, of human performers and actors, and it can still get better. It sounds like computer learning will be a big part of the future of that. So they can interpolate the things that are included. I, like I, that. I think the, the crux of it was that it will be another tool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it will help. Mm -hmm. But they still really want to put a lot of the pride into the animators and the, the manual understanding. No doubt. Yeah. The computer stuff will create shortcuts for like the mapping of the dots to, to rig. But they'll still be tuning stuff. I rewatched iRobot this past weekend, which if you haven't seen it in a while, it's worth revisiting. It came out 15 years ago. Oh. Right? Now, yeah. that's like the distance between Star Wars Episode 1, or Episode 4, rather, and Jurassic Park. Like, that, okay. it's a long time in, the, in terms of special effects. Right? Like, that went from no CG to the best CG, like, of the world had ever seen. Yep. And now we've gone from, like, 2004 to now to, like, Avengers Endgame. And 2004 looks like a video game. Like, you'd be surprised. You go back and watch iRobot, it's almost like you're, like, it's Tron. I mean, like, the, the compositing is so obvious now. But they were so ambitious that you get to see them pushing the envelope. And now that all of the seams are visible on HD, you mm -hmm. know, or just because of our experience being spoiled by amazing new special effects, you can really appreciate all the work that, that they went into it and the, the boundaries that they were pushing. Um, so I just highly recommend it. Yeah, it was a, it was a fully virtual character, yeah, the robot. No, yeah, but there's like, you know, handheld shots of crowd scenes with robots walking in between people. Mm. There's a lot of complicated special effects. Like the, the, the whole scene where the car chases, uh, there's just so much that they were trying to do that the technology was just capable of. Yeah. That I, I really, like, I wonder what Endgame and current special effects will look like 15 years from now. Like, will it be the same thing where we look back and it just all looks like CG? It's hard to imagine that because we're seeing it in IMAX and, like, these incredibly high-def yeah. uh, situations and we're not seeing that kind of stuff. So, like, what? We're going to see some of the, like, hidden Easter eggs in Endgame more clearly 15 years from now? I'm not I'm not <laughs> sure. You're talking about Howard the Duck? Hey! Spoilers. What are you doing? <laughs> Did you not mention that? Oh, was that during our spoiler period? Yeah, we're not in some spoiler period. Oh, sorry. That just sorry. ruined the entire plot of the movie. So sorry. I'm so, he, Howard the Duck has given away in all the TV commercials now. Oh, is oh. he? <laughs> no. <laughs> I believed you for a second. Uh. All right, uh, let's move on. Okay. The VR Minute. Virtual reality this week. Countdown's on. A week yeah, away. We are like within a week now. This is wonderful news from the Oculus Quest. You ordered one. Yep. yep. We all ordered one. We, well, one of us ordered two. So. Uh, what, what is there to say? between now, uh, up since, since last week. Uh, we've gotten access to the full Superhot. Uh, Superhot developers put out a big blog post about the, the amount of effort it took to port Superhot over to Quest. They had to rebuild a lot of those basic systems, the gun systems, even the porting of the levels. The new version of Superhot now, no pyramid to grab. It just goes from level to level. You know, being full untethered 360 just changes the game dynamic a yeah, little bit. Yeah, like they have a video of somebody walking around walls where you would normally have just been standing. Right, right, right. Um, and a lot of this is to justify that Super Hot will not be a cross buy game. And for people who have the, the Quest version and want to get the Quest version with the, the pay full price, and I think it's totally worth it. But besides justifying that, I think that this is an important article to help people, you know, laymen like me, understand what this porting effort is like. Just you know, if you can't understand 1% of the work that it took over the past six months for PC games to be ported onto a mobile processor, 72 hertz stereo at a higher resolution, like this is a mammoth effort. And I think that like, I love reading about this thing because I love appreciating the art 
of making games. Yeah, yeah, clearly a lot of fun doing it. And you know, it's, their VR version was so successful, more successful than the flat screen PC version. It really, you know, for, for Quest users, it, it's it's one of the killer apps. But we're assuming that we're not going to see this level of effort having to be done going forward. We're not going to see people develop something purely for one platform and then spend this kind of effort to port it to well, a different this one. This didn't exist when they made yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Hot. So that that's what I Yeah. I, I think this is a and not the new normal. If, it's a No, I think the new normal will probably be going the other direction. I think there'll be if people want to ship on Quest, they'll develop for Quest and ship on PC additionally. I have a request if there's any super hot developers listening to this podcast or people connected to the super hot developers. Uh, one of the things I know they added in a, a last version was um, uh, like a almost a horde mode, unlimited game. You know, like like enemies just come at you. Yeah. Um, and the game is played in slow motion. Of course, if you know super hot, like you are in bullet time the whole time. I would love a record feature to let you record your session in the horde mode. So how long, however long you can survive the onslaught, and then let you play it back from a third person camera with like a virtual camera in sped up real time. So you can get your John Wick style mm -hmm. action movie okay. in real time. That's interesting. Or any speed. Or any speed, yeah. sure. You can like speed it up, slow it down, and yeah. kind of direct your own John Wick style action choreograph sequence. Because uh, like Blade and Sorcery does the thing where you can play it in slow motion and people then record it and then speed it up in normal speed. Mm -hmm. And it looks like you're the most badass melee warrior ever i would love that for super hot and maybe potentially play it from third person fixed camera perspective rec room posted on reddit yesterday and their subreddit which is also like their official um you know forum by the way uh what we should expect from the quest version of rec room on launch so it won't be the whole game but that's the grand plan everything that is released is 100 percent cross-platform so this this is not a quest environment. This is you'll be playing with PC players and PSVR players, which uh, which is definitely a good thing because that means at launch there will be people populated in the games. So what will you get? You're gonna get the Maker Room and any games that are made from the Maker Room, which is like if, where most of their effort has been. Besides the port, the past six months of porting the Quest, they've put so much effort into the Maker Room. Um, and it's taken off kind of a Minecraft community where people are making things that the developers are surprised by. Uh, and I'm super stoked that that's going to be on there because that's the kind of thing that I think my son will, will take an interest in. Rec Center will be in there, the dorm room. And then of the games, you're going to get Paintball, which to me is the big win, Charades, Dodgeball, and Paddleball. But Jeremy. I know. No quests. What about a quest on a quest? Exactly. It's coming soon. Coming June. Soon or well, June? They said June, but we'll see. We'll see. I mean, I'm hoping it is June. I hope it is within a month. That would be great. And they're launching with two quests. Yeah. Jumbotron and Golden, Tr Golden Trophy. Yeah, exactly. So uh, Jumbotron is one of my favorites. I love that. It's the sci-fi themed one. Ton of fun. And yeah, as soon as they get a quest up there, I think that'll be great. Like, I, I can't wait. I think Jumbotron is probably the best fit, maybe, for one to launch with because it has so much long range with like mm -hmm. the rifles and your, you know, you can your space blasters, right? And yeah. With full untethered, it's pretty fast pace. Three sixty, yeah. you can like not dive and roll, but you can kite around corners and you can really feel like you're you're shooting your blasters off, as opposed to the the melee stuff that will still work well in the quest. Um, I just can't wait for the pirate quest. We tried redoing the pirate quest this week, and it just made me want. Go through the whole thing. Yeah, because we hadn't played Pirate Quest since they added free locomotion where you can just walk around. It is so easy. It, well, I don't know about we so easy. We didn't beat it. We still didn't make it. We didn't make it. But I, I agree with you. I love the Pirate Quest. It's it, that's That was the first one that was three players, right? Mm -hmm. So it's also, I like it for that reason too. Because uh, sometimes I only have two friends. But there is, <laughs> uh, uh, oh yeah, I asked about, are there any modes they anticipate not being able to port? And the answer was no. Oh. That they expect all modes eventually to be possible to port. The hardest one being Rec Royale. Of course. Oh, yeah. yeah. Just that the, makes sense. The load. But, like, they are planning a season two of that. So I'm imagining that those are going to dovetail. Like, they're taking into consideration what needs to be done on Quest, although I have no idea. Hmm. Uh, Beat Saber on PC VR side is leaving early access. Its price is $30. 
Um, That's the final price. I b- believe it's a it's a price increase to thirty dollars. Yes, from twenty dollars. Got it to thirty dollars, and mm-hmm. it will have a level generator, level editor, level editor. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Which unfortunately does not look sound like it will be portable to the Quest version. It's PC only. PC only. Yeah. Um, and not cross by either. No, no. I mean, again, another potential killer app for for Quest. Yep. Uh, let's talk about AR a little bit. So uh, Cherry Ellsworth, who previously uh, was at Valve and then launched Kickstarter for Cast AR, which uh, unfortunately didn't come to fruition. They refunded all their backers. Uh, has been teasing a new AR glasses company called Tilt Five. Same. It sounds like same idea. Glasses that have projectors built in that do bounce back yep. onto a reflective surface, uh, designed for kind of tabletop AR gaming, uh, but look much more completed from at least the, the pictures we've seen. So just to explain what Norm just said, people will put out a mat in front of them, and multiple people can sit around this mat with AR glasses on, but everybody gets an independent, unique view, yeah. augmented reality. So I might see something entirely different than Norm. You could play Battleship entirely on a flat mat. And the benefit of that is the mat itself has properties. It's very reflective. It's basically the same kind of material that you get on like stop signs. It reflects exactly the light shown into it back into where the light came from. And so there are projectors on the glasses that project onto the mat and bounce back into your eyes. So you get full field of view, essentially, um, from those projection images as high resolution as those Pico projectors can be. And as long as the mat's big enough, you don't lose the seams. They can have. It can look like there are objects on the map. The bigger the map, the bigger the object. The taller the object you can get. Uh, there's not much more information mm-hmm. about it. I think they definitely it sounds like they've learned a lot of uh, lessons from their first go at this with Cast AR and this already, without having seen it, looks like more polished, you know, ready for consumer type product. At least from the hardware ID, from the video they've shared. Uh, a single controller, the type, the type of like gesture-based controller. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I can't wait because if you it's just... Neat. It's different kind of tech than anything else people yeah. are working on. Yeah. Uh, and it looks like, you know, the mat, they, they designed for a specific mat size with tracking dots on the outside that the system will read. Um, I'm, I'm curious about this controller. It's like more like a wand, mm-hmm. you know, with... Uh, with like a pointer and, and four, four buttons. But, um, you know, it, for D&D style games, this could be really, really fun. I mean, yeah, it's the it's board games that are computer generated. You know, it's it's the future. Yeah. And and to, to think about like the type of 3D you'd see, they're not just talking about things that pop up on top of the mat, but really the mat itself being a window, which solves for a lot of the, the border stuff a window into a bigger world beneath the map, which really is smart for AR. Any chance Jerry's going to be at Maker Faire with this stuff? She's usually know. there. Yeah, maybe. They're, they're, they're Bay Area. We've reached out to see when we can potentially do a preview on it. I just noticed that they have Space Invaders. I don't know if they've actually licensed that, but they, maybe it's just a, a demo. Mm-hmm. But uh, did you see the Space Invaders Kickstarter for the board game? No. Space Invaders board game, people. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> What? How does that work? <laughs> it's a full-fledged board game. Every single alien is a is a card, and you and you have your and you have to shift them around. Uh, I don't know about that. I don't think you have, that would be a lot of work. Yeah. But you put your guys at the bottom, and you have your shields, and the shields are different pieces of, of wood or plastic, and so as they get hit, they go away, and you can move your guy left, and right, and fire up, and I guess you can get power ups and things like that. But it's neat. It's like I don't know. It's relatively affordable. It's like a twenty dollar investment or fifty dollars for the for the special edition. Hmm. Um is that it for for VR news? Yeah. I want to know what you thought about not doing cross by, cross by, not cross by. What like is that I feel like it's a gamble on developers' parts because sometimes it's gonna encourage people to buy that you so you might lose some sales by not doing cross by or Maybe you'll make more money because the hardcore will pay twice. I think it depends on how successful that game was initially in terms of the, the yeah. supply and demand side of it. I think I, that from I, a pure development standpoint, it makes I have no problem with developers charging twice because it sounds like it is has been 
a lot of work. Dude, I totally respect that. And yeah. and looking at it from that perspective, yes. Yes, if it takes more development hours, you should charge for it. Yep. But you could also look at it as delayed development that was all a part of the initial, you know, run. And so I think a question will be how people treat the the pricing for Quest versus Rift. Mm. And I don't know the pricing for the games yet. You know, we know things like Rec Room will be free and there will be free things on there for sure. But on the desktop side, publishers have not been shy to price them like real games, as they should. $40, $50, because it is a lot of development time on these games, even though they're not necessarily recouping all their costs because of the how big the user base is compared right. to a traditional console. On the Quest... We've also seen titles launch too high and they've had to reduce the price. Yes, which economically totally makes sense. Steam sales, Oculus sales, bundles, all that jazz. On Quest, there's potential for a lot more users because it is a big push mm -hmm. from Facebook Oculus. Right. It's their first gaming system, curated store, mainstream appeal, no computers, just works out of the box. Like that, that means the huge potential base. At the same time, there's going to be potential expectation that this is a mobile type device and the game experience, regardless of the quality of experience being the same, the graphics may not be as good. So, But the Switch has set that bar pretty well and Zelda costs 60 bucks. Yes. But still, from what I've played so far in Quest, they are more mobile games. They are more $10, $20 games. But I'm talking I, about the games that we just talked about, like Super Hot is yeah. just as good as the PC. Yeah. Right? Uh, Beat Saber is just as good. I think it'll be, they'll have a hard time selling like a $40 Super Hot. Mm. Now, I, I, how much mm -hmm. is Super Hot on, on PC? Um, on the Rift side. It, it's not that much, right? Like yeah. 25 bucks. The, is, is, the biggest problem I see, like I, I, mean, I totally respect, again, the development hours, but part of me just thinks, like you just want as many people playing your game as humanly possible. And part of... Well, that's like, the microtransaction a, argument. A tool to get there. Well, I'm not saying it should be free to play either. Like, But a way to get there would, is this cross-buy idea. But you, then it just completely alienates the Steam users. I'm okay with that. You are? Yeah. I think there's there's a debate made about whether a developer should allow for cross-buy between Oculus and Steam. And I, I get the argument that you're if you buy it on one, one of these storefronts... Yeah. You don't necessarily have to get on the other storefront because there are services that are provided on the storefronts that cost money. Like Steam not only needs their cut, but they need to pay people to manage the downloads, manage the patching, compatibility, all that stuff. That's Yeah, but the people who the developers got their cut from you if when you bought it on Steam, and they got your cut if you bought it on the Oculus store. It's it, So they should be able to give the same, you know. It's like if you buy a movie on iTunes, you should get on Netflix. Right. And you shouldn't. That's true, Norm. Yeah. I don't expect that. You don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad yeah. I could put it in, in terms. Yeah. That makes sense. I think it's going to be an interesting, you, you, we'll, we'll see some interesting discussions on the, on the forums. Yeah. It, it, for me, the more interesting thing is the perception of mobile. And mm -hmm. I want to see, and I don't think I have seen yet, uh, a, a full AAA game on Quest that is Breath of the Wild, that is Mario Odyssey. It's not fair. Why is those, it not fair? Those are classic all-time games. Right. With but, all the benefits of 30 years of console play. Fine. Well, it's the original IP. Uh, but on the Switch, that proved that just because you had lower graphics fidelity right. and, and a lower processor, uh, slower processor, you weren't constrained. That was the fear, right, with Switch. Mm -hmm. That when they announced that it would run on that old Tegra, that it was you weren't going to get console quality equivalent experiences and they prove us wrong you got amazing quality of experiences yeah. and, and nintendo's in a very fortunate base or place because they could afford to spend money on dev teams to make a game of that scope yeah. and bet on switch being a big system seller and and it has been very successful oculus even with their partnership with studios even with the amount of time that devs have, devs have had with quest and even on rift I don't. I still see that more on the PC side. I, I think we're just even just now getting that on the PC side, 
You know, Lone Echo, I think, is a standout example, but with this year with Asgard's Wrath, with uh, Stormland, mm-hmm. the the big AAA games that can stand up against a console AAA game. Because ultimately, that's what consumers are making the purchasing choice between. But I don't think that there's anything about the device that keeps it from having those games on it. Like, obviously... I, I, hope, I, ho- I really hope that's the case. I mean, I know there's constrained storage. That's one thing. But also battery life, which I don't think is as much an issue now that we've seen that battery packs can charge it and mm-hmm. you can play at the same time. Yeah. And that just might be breaking a game down, you know, a 20 hour big AAA game down into more manageable 30 minute game segments in your level design. Which is probably a good idea for VR anyway. Yeah. 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 I think that VR, the argument that VR naturally brings just benefit of the improved quality be, being present, being you know, hand you know, controls. Yeah. That only takes you so far. You still need content. You still need amazing experiences that go beyond your arcade. VR arcade style experiences, proven. Robo Recall. Beat Saber, Robo Recall, Space Pirate Trainer. Like that stuff, proven, but that stuff, those are going to be $10, $20 games. I'm so, are we, now you're making me a little bit surprised that Oculus doesn't have a big launch title for the Quest. I think Vader is it. But Vader isn't it also because yeah. it's episodic and it is piecemeal and it is if, if all three of those release at once for you know thirty five bucks it's gonna be thirty bucks if pricing is you know ten dollars each um, that could have been it you know three hour but it's not Lone Echo but it's not Lone Echo yeah what is Ready Out on doing yeah that's what I want to know I, I feel like if they do come out something and we hope they will they were on the list of Quest you know uh, partners I feel like it's still gonna be in the arcade. Because you're going to get more mileage f- from designing something that has a lot of replayability. We don't need to create asset, asset, asset. Well, their multiplayer games are in that vein. Yep, yep. I, I maybe it's uh, maybe it's Rec Room. Maybe it's the Quest. Mm. Quest in Rec Room being that. Um, I'm not saying it needs to be perfect graphic fidelity. I just need yeah. deeper experiences. I think Quest will need that, and maybe that's a second generation thing. Uh, that does it for. VR Minute. Do we have one more segment we want to go in? Sure. Let's do it. Come on. The 500th yeah. episode. Urr. What you're like, really get there. Urr. Connect with that. Where's the button? <laughs> Where's the. Ah, oh, here it is. Let's unmute it. Things that annoy me. Is this it? Are we capping this? segment off now no whatever you have left on the list we're going to go through but next was, week the yeah. idea was we'd go through like 500 right? well yeah you but then you, you you skipped a few weeks jeremy i know I don't was, make stuff up i'm not no it's like okay all right um this is this is a quirky one uh this is and i'm not sure that everyone would agree with me on this because some people believe that language is what you make it i happen to think that words have definitions so you know when people say uh that that food there was f- fourfold the amount of food in this buffet. They mean four times. They mean that there was, you know, if you had two plates in one one you know room and fourfold in the other, they they meant uh, you know eight times, yeah. right? Yeah. That this isn't computers. They're not talking about folding them in half. But yeah. that is what it means, and it is amazing how seldom it is used correctly. So fold is it's a is when you you double it every time that you have a fold, right? So so four fold two, you'd go to four eight sixteen. So that's sixteen times as much food in the other room. That means something entirely different, especially when you get to higher numbers. It's an exponential increase. And so it's like decimating, where people misuse that phrase. What does that all mean? Time. It means one to, to one tenth of. Oh. I like that. And people, because yeah, you know, D- they just mean that generically to destroy, destroy completely, right? But you take it literally when, well, when I don't you hear actually, that word. I, I, I don't because mind. you're one of the people that think language is what you make. No, it. I think colloquially, <laughs> as long as what important part of language is understanding what intention. Yeah, I see. And I, I, I will understand it and then just judge the person silently. Oh, silent judging is so good. That's where I fall. But that judgment is. But not, I don't need to correct them. I I don't correct people. Okay. Because I've I've realized that the world has moved on. Silent judges unite. However, if you're one of these people that care about the words that you use, let me let me just hopefully enlighten you as Norm has just done about the word decimation. Oh my God, that, Alexander Hamilton and, and Thomas Jefferson must it would eat us. That the word fold means something. It's an exponential increase. Tenfold is an enormous difference than ten times. 
So is that just a two-fold computer that we talked about earlier? So let me, like a single fold. What what's <laughs> sad about this is it is like when people use the word fold, this is the perfect uh, opportunity to teach about how computers count, because it, that's how binary works. Every time you add another bu a bit, it doubles. It's exponential. The uh, number that you're able to calculate. Kind so, of. Did you listen to the radio lab this weekend? No. Oh my goodness! This is one of the best radio labs ever. They talk about how they shortcut um, counting bits, especially when there's large data sets involved, and mm -hmm. they they do it essentially by flipping two bits at once. It's this exceptional listen uh, that gets pretty technical. And the reason they did it is they found voting machines that reported incorrect number of votes by four thousand and ninety six votes. Oh, that tells you that number is mm -hmm. that's power. So yeah. They're using yeah. powers of two mm -hmm. in how they flip the bits. But tell me what you mean. What do you mean? Kind of. Let me explain to you what I what I yeah. think. So you got a single bit that can be at any value between zero and one. So you got two yeah. values. A two bit number can be any value you know between zero and three. That's a four yeah. digits. You add another. Mm -hmm. It's eight. You right. all the way up to like eight bits. You get the commonly known number two hundred and fifty six for eight mm -hmm. bit. So, so every time you add a bit, you're doubling the number of possible figures. So what do you yeah. mean kind of? No, I mean, that's what it was about. But the way they were uh, shortcutting it is they were, okay. oh, when they're flipping binary bits, like the binary bits were right. signifying the, the power of two. I just think that, the, that the, w this is a great opportunity. P people don't know how computers think. And here's this phrase that everybody uses all the time, fourfold the number of times. And that's an opportunity to learn how computers talk. How they think about numbers and teachers should do that they should use the word fold they should correct kids about grammar and at the same time educate us about counting and binary okay dad cool. i'd like that this is <laughs> the hill that you're going to die on the folding yeah there are a lot of grammar and language you, you wanna, uh, i'll do another yeah. one oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, oh, okay okay 100 all right um jeez ah oh i love the internal he's connecting to yeah. it the material. Did this is you, why we can't have an AI generated Jeremy. We need the real one here. Yeah, you know, I mean, obviously, like, I don't want to like make people think I don't hate junk mail. Like, I hate normal things too. But and so I don't know if this falls into the same category as junk mail. But there are people in San Francisco that will cross the crosswalk, like, without looking left and right. And this is again, like, I know people who will disagree with me on this. This is like the pedestrians always have the right of way. And you're right. And I'm not a bad person. I don't want to hit anybody. But people who cross these crosswalks, maybe it's turning yellow. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's I'm at a stop sign and there's a crosswalk there. People just look. Just look both directions. We're all in this together. I'm, I don't want to hit you. I will let you go. I just want to make eye contact so that like something bad doesn't happen. Oh, so is this about safety or just human connection? Safety. You just want to be able this, to look at them dude, in the eye and see, 100 safety. get a sense of what they're really all safety. about. Safety. Do you understand what I'm saying? Have you seen this? Like that people will just boldly cross the crosswalk, and I'm not talking about the ones who are doing it when there's when they shouldn't be. This isn't like they're walking across a, a red light or the or the, the the red man who says don't cross, although that's annoying too. That's like especially annoying. I'm talking about the people who are doing it right when they're crossing when they should, but they just don't look. They don't look left and right. I mean, why do that to yourself? Why do that to me? I'm actually with you here. I think we thank you. We don't have enough on uh, pedestrians actually having a, a responsibility in in pedestrian safety. Yes, you know, and I'm not even talking about like we should take turns, like pedestrians wait for cars. There's always a group of pedestrians that will let a car pass if they've been there for a while, and I appreciate that. You're not one of those tunnel people that all pedestrians need to go underground, leave the cars for the surface? No, 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 no. no. I'm a pedestrian advocate, believe it or not. I, I believe the pedestrians are always in the right, but let's imagine that we're, we've both been in each other's shoes. You've been in a car before. I've been a pedestrian. I look every direction before I cross any street. Just do it, man. Let's just think about each other. Don't let me hit you accidentally. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's the most passive aggressive thing you've ever said. <laughs> well done. All right. All right. Uh, thank you all for listening. We'll be back next week with the 501st episode. I, I want to plug one thing on 
uh, May 29th, I'm uh, interviewing Adam on stage oh. in San Jose about his new book. Nice. So if there are any Bay Areans here, uh, come down. It's technically in Campbell, which I think is near San Jose. Uh, there's not many tickets left. So if you want to come by, I think he's autographing some books after the talk. Uh, hear me ask inane questions of Adam. Come on down. All right. And he- also this weekend is Bay Area Maker Fair. Hope to see you there. We'll be there Saturday and Sunday. Uh, it's in San Mateo Fairgrounds. And That's true. Tickets available now. It's also, uh, what's it called? There's a, there's a pinball thing I'm going to in Lodi, California. Pinball Lodi. I, oh, it's like the Golden State Pinball Festival. That's it. So Google that if you're in Northern California and you want to be there maybe for part of the weekend and then go to Maker Fair. I'll be at Maker Fair on Sunday. Very cool. All right. Uh, we have an outro this week. Yeah, Justin, a.k.a. Speed. I just want to listen hey. to that outro last time. Comes again. We could reuse it. You want to hear that one? I don't know which one that was, though. All right, let's listen to the new one. All right, here we go. Hi there, I didn't see you. That's it. Yeah, I guess there are other movies to tell, James, like Avatar 2 and 3 and 4 and Alien and Alien whatever other Alien movies he made. That's it. Come at me, James Cameron. I'm ready. He's probably a listener. Oh, hundred about the sex planet, Papa. <laughs> <laughs>